Well, hello, folks. This is Todd Van Allen, host of Comedy Above the Pub. That is Cat Pete, you and me. The uh, pub is fake. The guests are real. Uh, we are part of the Antica Network, a podcast. Might be Antica. Who knows? I go with the Italian for ancient. Now, listen, it's JFL 42 time here in Toronto. Uh, I got to do my show earlier on at Absolute. It was great. Thank you. Anyone who uh, came out to watch that fantastic show it was a pleasure to be a part of it. Now, um, we got invited to do com- some junket work. Now, what is a junket? You might ask yourself. Well, it's where you sit in a hotel lobby and wait for a comic to come by and you talk to them. And that's what we did. We got to, we got to talk to five amazing comics that you get to listen to right after I'm done introducing them. So uh, on this show, uh, we talked to comedians Ali Sadiq, Kyle Kinane, Kevin Kamiya, DJ Mosner, and uh, we ended all off with a uh, previous guest of the show, Andy Kindler. These guys were so great, and uh, we couldn't be happier to be part of uh, the uh, the junket that uh, JFL 42 put on for us, and uh, I couldn't be happier to bring these comics to you. Uh, and the invite is open to all of them once again to come on and do regular episodes once they're in. They, I think they were okay with uh, that being a possibility, so here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, here's me talking to five fantastic comics for you right now. That is the worst thing, like when you think, like when you're traveling and go, oh, you're going to stereotype the place. So you just go, Canada, bring a sweater. Bring a parker. <laughs> because the last time I was supposed to come, I've been having bad, bad um, vibes with Canada for a while now. How come? What's up? Um, every time I get ready to come, right, I have to postpone the shows. Okay. Like I was supposed to come to Edmonton and right. um, another spot, you know, the Brick Bronson's house. Mm-hmm. Coming, yep. I, and I haven't. I postponed them like three times. Right. And it's like, they like, Tammy is like, yo, when are you ever coming? We just keep having you on the books. And I think that the people in Edmonton keep saying, we're not, let us know, promote it once he get here. Right. No no more pictures of him. No more flyers. Until we see the whites of his eyes. (laughs) We we gonna come once we hear him on the radio or see him in Canada. Right. I would take it even further. It's like until they see you with like them them pulling the mic out of the stand. (laughs) Okay, start the posters. Start start the posters. Bring everyone in. We we wanna make sure. We're having a cold open on the Wednesday just to see how it goes. Just in front of staff and your friends in edmonton just to make sure yeah and and it's been it's been like that so um i'm excited and then i then i run into him in montreal right and he's like oh so you can't come to canada unless it's a festival i'm like right no no (laughs) and then i saw rick bronson i saw him in montreal right 47 times right. I ran into one person. Right. 47 times. Uh-huh. I didn't run into anybody else that many no. times. <laughs> Every time I looked around, he was, he was looking at me like, uh-huh. that's another one. Yeah. <laughs> and then yep. we start, it, it became, we start counting how mm-hmm. many times we ran into each other. Elevator, mm-hmm. waiting on a car, in the club, right. in the, around the bar, right. It, at a show, I uh-huh. would, like I would be doing a show and I look over and it's just him. Right. right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, <laughs> There's, but that Montreal does that, right? Because it's just it's such a such a concentration of comics and stuff like that. Because everyone's kind of at the Hyatt and they all do that. Yeah. It's so easy to keep running into people like that, and you yes. just like it's like to the point where like you say like, I'm not stalking you. We just happen to be on the same floor. Just That's happen it. to be on right. the same floor. Rich Hall is not returning my calls anymore. That's <laughs> not, not at all. It and now I would I would rather the Montreal feel right. now that I'm I'm doing. Um, this is kind of. Everything is kind of for. I I think I've only ran into maybe one or two comics. Right. And he was like, "You don't really, you're not really seeing anybody." You know, I would love to run into Bill Burr. Uh-huh. You know, I opened for Bill Burr. Yeah. You know, getting, he was getting ready for a special, and I was opening for him. He thought mm-hmm. I was fantastic, and we kept in touch. And now, you know, I haven't seen anybody from my agency. You know, right. and I heard Ali Wong was here. She's mm-hmm. on UTA. I would, right. you know, love to. Hey, I'm your label mate. Yep. You know, it's like it's <laughs> like being on Def Jam. And records and, you know, not being able to do nothing with nothing. I'm like, right. hey, LL, you want to do a song together? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, and he just, like, blanks you in the ele- elevator. He's like, oh, sorry, the button. Slide. I don't, I don't know you, sir. I don't right. know you. It, you know, it's, but. But, but to be fair, comedy is kind of like that. I think, like, a lot of performances are like that, where I will go to a city, like, like when I'm performing in Montreal, mm-hmm. and, like, I look at who's over at the other club, and it's like, I can't see him at home. 
So now I have to go and like go over to the other club and see my buddy. Yeah. And go, what are you doing here? It's like, I'm, well, I'm here. You know, I'm, here, you know and, and, I'm at the other place. Yeah, and just to have fun. I, I think it's happened to me in the states once. Okay, I'm I'm in Baltimore and DL, my mentor DL Hughley is in mm-hmm. Baltimore as well. Right, I, and I start on a Thursday. He came in on Friday, so I didn't have a Sunday show. He had a Sunday mm-hmm. show, so. I'm leaving my show, going over to his show afterwards, right. and just hanging out. And he's like, "Then Sunday, he's, we have dinner on Sunday because I stayed in town." He was like, "Well, um, you you want to do a set?" Yeah. And I was like, "No. <laughs> are you uh, are you charging me for the dinner that you just paid right. for?" Right. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, "No, but you know, just do a set. You know, make it easy on the old uh-huh. man." So I go up and I do a set <laughs> and. I'm like, yo, um, don't expect a lot. The people are like, oh my god, it's amazing. Oh, yeah. I'm like, don't, don't, no, mm-hmm. don't do that. Right. Don't, don't expect a lot of me. I am an appetizer, mm-hmm. and, and, <laughs> I'm, and it's not gonna be that good. It's yeah. gonna be cold. And so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just go up with a newspaper. What's in the news? And, yeah. and did, had a great set, and then he, he's like, so you had to do it. I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. had to. Had you, to. You, I had to pay for that dinner that you just, you know, <laughs> you just forced me to pay for. So, mm-hmm. man, it, this is a great time to be a comic and, yeah. and have a, a a plethora of friends that, you know, are in good positions. And you meet, I'm meeting new people, you right. know, like you, yourself mm-hmm. and all these new comics that I'm running into. And I met Mark Norman, man. Yeah. And, you know, this is a guy, I didn't even know he even liked me. He's like... <laughs> He was like, yo, man, I saw you was on the thing. I'm like, yo, that's who I want to open mm-hmm. up. Cause I just want to meet this guy. He's right. crazy. So I, I do the show with him and I'm a fan and, right. and I run into him at the comedy bar and I'm like, yo, man, great set. Mm-hmm. And he was like, I thought you left. You watched my set. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I watched the whole set. Then yeah. I, I went. I told him different areas so he had no I was there for right, a right, long right, time. Right, right. I'm like, yo, this uh-huh. beginning, that was a crazy joke. Yeah. Then the purple suit. Mm-hmm. And then I, the baby, you know, mm-hmm. getting his heart ate, you know, and I was going through his set and he's like, Are you serious? Like you really was and then I ran into Ron, Ron Peeps, man. Mm-hmm. Ron Reeps and he I was like, Yo, man, you are a fantastic comedy. And he's like, Tell everybody. <laughs> tell everybody. No one knows. You tell them. Right. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, so then I got to hang out with Roy Woods, mm-hmm. you know, Junior. You know, we on the same, you know, you know, another label mate and right. another friend. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, he, I mean, he's very, he's one of the people who, you know, I live in Houston. So it, right. the, the Harvey thing happened. Mm-hmm. And, he did, you know how some people call, hey man, let me know if you need anything. Right. That's just a blanket. Way, sure. You know, Roy hit me and he was like, do you need money? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he X'd out everything yeah. else. Do you, you need, need yeah. money? Right. I'm like, um, no, not really. Not yet. But, Underwear know, would be good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm a dryer. Right. <laughs> how about pumpkin spice? Do you have any of that? <laughs> That is a dude. Oh, it, it, the, I can smell it in my nostrils mm-hmm. now, and, and, and it was a month ago when I smelled that. It's right, great. pumpkin right. spice is insane. Yeah, I know. It's well, it's our national treasure. <laughs> it's that. <laughs> it's it's a lot of people think it's hockey, but no, it's I it's pumpkin it was, spice. Uh, what, I thought it was poutine. Oh yeah, that's uh, we we'll claim that for sure. <laughs> like that's a that's a Quebec thing, but certainly like oh yeah, that's Canadian for sure. Yeah, and, you can't turn your head around here and not have a poutine. That's, that's, I, I um. And do they have do they have veggie poutine? Yeah, you can get veggie poutine. Yeah, I thought the cheese was okay. So now you're gonna get into that. So are you looking like a vegan poutine? You're looking for something like that? Are you a vegetarian? Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, you can. You, you know what? I guarantee you, in the city, you can find a, a vegan poutine. I guarantee it. Yeah. Cause when we're when we're done this, I will find you a place. Y'all got rid of dairy here in Canada. Canada got rid of dairy. They say it's not part of the major. Five, you know, groups oh, that you need. I've been eating wrong for quite a long time. And, and they, yeah. they just did it like, mm-hmm. in, like in the last couple of months. Oh, okay. It was like, no I was, told me. I was excited. I was like, mm-hmm. oh, it's going to be a lot of vegan restaurants when you get to Canada because they just got rid of dairy. Right. And <laughs> nobody knows but me. That's right, what I yeah. get for reading the actual paper. <laughs> uh huh. If it's not on social media, it, di- it didn't happen. I want you to go into a grocery store, just point to the dairy <laughs> counter and find a guy and go, why is this here? Yeah, this, <laughs> hey, I thought y'all. Is, is, is this black market milk? 
Because I read that, and it was like, yo, they only broke it down to, like, it used to be five. Now it's only four major foods. Right, yeah. He said dairy is not a necessity. Really? My father, mm. if he, if my father ever read that in the paper, he would say, I told you. Right. I, think I remember him years ago calling me, like, yo, do you know that human beings mm. are the only people who drink other animals' milk? Yeah. We're disgusting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, what about cereal? And he's like, yeah. use water. Oh, God. <laughs> like, no. Like, <laughs> like, no, um, Honey Nut Cheerios tastes way right. better in no. some sort of milk. I would use maple syrup before I used water. I, I, I use hemp milk. Hemp milk? And I make it myself, okay. which is in, which is the best thing All right. in the world. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it, and it literally saved my daughter's life. Really? Yeah. She, How'd that go? She, um, Pitocin is a drug that they use to give the women to right. induce them or whatnot. Mm-hmm. And it has egg in it. And most children can't oh, okay. do the egg. Right. So, you know, once you inject it to the mother, straight to the baby. So my right. daughter comes out horrible. It's right. like the worst thing. So she can't. She can't breastfeed. Mm-hmm. She can't do anything. We trying to find things to get weight on her. I call this guy. He's like, yo, let me tell you what to do. Doctors are giving me, they, they, mm-hmm. to the point where they about to put a feeding bag right. on her. Right. Cause she's like one and my daughter's literally 10 pounds. Sure. And oh, that ain't good. <clears throat> no. Like she's literally 10 pounds. Yes. And they're like, we don't get her up to 15 pounds. Mm hmm. We gonna have to put this feeding bag, right? On. And I'm like, nah, we not gonna do no, the feeding no, bag. No, 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 no. Nah. So, and I know her; she's gonna pull it out. Mm-hmm. She, so, this guy said, "This is what you are gonna have to do, man. Hemp milk is gonna be the, the option. Okay, we're gonna add weight to your baby, and we're gonna hemp milk and quinoa flakes." Okay. Never heard of none of this. No. By the so, way, I'm sure there's 18 restaurants in Toronto that serve that as an entree. <laughs> I am positive of it. <laughs> so your your baby is very progressive. Yeah. yeah. So I I find a way to make the hemp milk. He mm-hmm. tell me how to make it to blend it myself because you don't want to go and get all this stuff with all this additives in it. Mm-hmm. So I buy the um the quinoa flakes and I'm blending all this stuff, putting it in her bottle. Right. And I'm literally watching her. This is the only thing that she is really eating. Like, right. like this is like delicious to her. Right. She's like, yeah, like I eat this all day. And I'm literally watching her mm-hmm. grow. Right. And it's insane. like why she swallows. Yeah. yeah. Like her skin, mm-hmm. everything is getting like, she's getting weight. So we go back to the doctor. She's at like 16 pounds. Right. And they like, What's what's going on? Uh-huh. I'm like, yo, she's eating. And they're right. like, what is she eating? And mm-hmm. I tell them, they're like, you're not going to be able to sustain on that. So cut to my daughter's about to be two years old. Mm-hmm. And she's maybe at 24 pounds. Okay. One of the strongest kids that you'll see. So I have another baby after her. The baby comes out almost 10 pounds. Right. So she's wearing her sister's clothes right like and my my <laughs> she's like my my smaller baby is like she want to pick her up and like no right. your sister who's a month right is bigger than you you're yeah, two yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah like she's huge uh-huh. and I- <laughs> so meanwhile your wife is like uh could you not just find a middle ground? <laughs> it's like and, and, 10 or like, what was it? What was your first child's birth weight? Like, my, not, no, my first daughter from first her, she yeah. um, was like four. Jesus. Four. I'm glad she's great now. It, yeah. It's like four even. And it's, and it's like a, it's like an insane thing mm-hmm. that she was that small, man. It, and it, when I look back on the, um, the photographs, I'm right. like, yo, she was the, it, it, it was insane. And you never think that you'll go through something like that with your kid. You're right. Like, this is, this is the crazy lady now. Uh huh. Oh my God. This is crazy lady now. Holy cow. She's got Pharrell's hat. <laughs> <laughs> and that's awesome. She's two and she was. She's two. It, yeah. In wow. November, she'd be two. That's awesome. And to but, the listener, we're looking at baby photos. 
Oh, and, yeah. and isn't it? And isn't the worst? It's yeah. like, it's, it's the worst. <laughs> and and it was. I crazy. am this close to showing you my nine week old puppy right now, so that's okay. And but oh my god, this was yeah. She was really little. You see, she didn't have any hair, uh-huh. like uh, but right. And then you cut, you cut two uh-huh. to this is crazy lady. Mm-hmm. Holy. It's crazy lady. Yeah, yeah. And that's our brother. He's, uh-huh. it's a big jump, six right. and four. But the hugest jump is this jump. This okay. is the, this is the craziest jump right. in the world. This is, this is the 18 year old that is in college at the time oh, with the small, the, with a small. <laughs> like, like the, the jump is real. The jump is how, real. Okay. So how many kids have you got? I have six. You have six kids. Yes. Okay. You know, there are other entertainment options. No, no, no. Let me tell you. How did you I, get six kids? I told my sister that I was going to catch her. Mm-hmm. My sister and her husband, they got married um, right. maybe 22 years ago. Uh-huh. They have six. Okay. My sister homeschooled every last one. Right. Have two at the University of Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And then she, she, the, the rest of them are coming out. That's awesome. So I told my sister, yeah, I'm probably going to catch you. Mm-hmm. Pass you. So um, I've been married three times. Okay. You know, yeah. different phases in your life, very young. And so I've blessed them with, with, with children, mm-hmm. blessed them with a lot of children. And my current wife, we just, we just racking them off. Man. We just like, <laughs> I'll be back to back in these things, man. It's insane. We love it. it. And, and it keep you young, man. You have uh-huh. a young wife, you know, and I don't really have to do anything. Right. You know, I'm just, hey, the lights are on in the roof. Uh-huh. That's all I have to do. <laughs> yeah. Provide food and clothing. Right. That's it. Right. I'm, I'm not in, I'm not involved in the process of, besides education. That's right. my, that's my field. Mm-hmm. So I'm So like, like you take them through like homework and stuff like that. Yeah. You it, just it, do all homework. That. Yeah. They're homeschool. Okay. So, well, that's so it, home homework. It, it, it's right. home homework. <laughs> like going nowhere. Like it, it's a, it's a great accomplishment to know mm-hmm. that. When I watch my son read or do math or whatever, like the, you, I actually you taught did him that. Like, yeah, he was at a, he was in a school for a second, and his lady said, "You know, well, you know, he he'll pick up the reading." And I'm like, "Nah, I think you're going slow. I think mm-hmm. that you that you really not putting forth the effort." Right. It's like, no, nah, you know. I said no because my 18 year old mm-hmm. was reading at three. Right. I know she was reading at three. Mm-hmm. So he's four. Right. He's behind. Right. So she was giving me up all these excuses. So I took him out of school. Mm-hmm. And he's been fine ever since. Yeah. It's like he hasn't been sick. No, he wouldn't be. Because all classrooms are are a Petri dish with pencils. Yeah. Like it's just like as soon as you go in, if you want to get sick, go to a PTA meeting. You know? That's, there it is. That's all you need to do. My son has not been sick since. Right. Like, I don't even understand why I even need health care anymore because, mm-hmm. you know, my, my baby girl, she was sick, but they couldn't fix her. Right. They couldn't fix it. So I went to a I, – I, I had a boil. I had what they call MRSA. Okay. Where it's like a, a bacteria infection mm-hmm. from probably using a public restroom. Okay. I, I know me. I don't use public restrooms. And at times that I have been forced to right. do this, something always bad mm-hmm. always happens. Right. So I, I this is my – Maybe third time ever having mercy. That's how I knew what it was. Mm-hmm. So it's a boil. Yeah. I don't go to the doctor. <laughs> I go to the barbershop. I went to the oh, barbershop no. and I'm like, yo, I have this boil on my leg. I right. need someone to lance this boil. Right. And we were like, why would you go to the barbershop? I'm like, why not? Right. Do you know the history of barbers? Mm-hmm. Barbers was the only people that could have corpses at the time. Yeah. The doctors had, it was no doctors yeah. with corpses. He had to get it from a barber. Right. And, and you look, the barbers used to take blood. Mm-hmm. You go, you get That's what the red and white is. Yeah, that's yeah. what the, you know. And so I don't think people know the history of barbers. So mm-hmm. I went, they have everything I need. Right. Iodine, peroxide, mm-hmm. alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> straight razor. Mm-hmm. S- s- lance it, squoze right. it. Right. Packed it with all this stuff. Mm-hmm. I get nervous because I think that maybe he cut me too deep. Uh huh. And so Did I did. You see it, bone? Was that part? No, of it was okay. just. I think it was. It wasn't. <laughs> I don't think that it was. I don't think I was taking care of it right. I was supposed <laughs> to put the gall inside and then let it heal. Anyway, right. I get nervous and I go to the doctor. Right. 
cost me a hundred and seventy five dollars to go to the doctor. Mm-hmm. They did it in the barbershop for free, and right. to get to the barbershop, the, and the, only for the doctor to say, "Man, whoever did this did a great job." Oh, good. Okay, <laughs> it, was like, it was like nothing's wrong with this man. Right, I just had to pay for the doctor. Mm-hmm. And all. It's like I can't believe it, right. and I and I had to tell him. Right. So he 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 you know gave me some antibiotics. That's the one thing they didn't have. Mm-hmm. Um. So I go in. I'm like, they're like, "What's wrong with you?" <laughs> I have a confession. I didn't trust you guys. Uh-huh. I went to the doctor. Right. And then, oh, <laughs> you went to the doctor. You whack. <laughs> you didn't trust us. You suck, man. And I'm like, no, mm-hmm. I. I I didn't trust y'all. Right. I thought it got infected. <laughs> they, <was> like, <laughs> they were they were they were offended. Right. They were offended that I went to the doctor. Right. <laughs> I haven't been since. Uh huh. I've been back since. I right. just did. Any, anything happens to me, I just go to my friends. Mm-hmm. They 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 know. Right. You know because did we always go to doctors? Nah, my grandmother fixed a lot of things mm-hmm. when I was growing up. Right. Come here. It didn't sound like it was gonna work. Right. But it always did. Yeah. Take a just don't drink all the bleach. Just take a. Sip. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Every time, don't drink all the bleach. Don't you drink like, all of it. This this is a look. Right. Don't okay. I'm gonna pour some of it out because you gonna drink the whole cap. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> don't okay. put, right. don't, don't put all that right. four nine on your face. Yeah. Like, don't let the flame engulf your entire arm. Just a little bit. Do you understand yeah. somebody pr- spray? You know the WD forty. Yep, yeah, somebody yeah. sprays that on your body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, yo, all right, look away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's making your eyes right. like, <laughs> bite on my wallet. <laughs> but it smells so good. Right. You know you can fish with it. Excuse me. You can yeah. fish with WD forty. You can fish with WD forty. They like the taste of it, or it's, a, it's like a pheromone or something. It's a like pheromone. Oh, okay. It's insane. And for somebody to tell you, like, no, see. I'm talking about you literally see him yeah. out fishing you. Yeah. Y'all in the same boat. <laughs> you throwing the same <laughs> And he like, see, let me tell you what you ain't got. You ain't got the secret <laughs> sauce. The secret <laughs> sauce for fish. He mm-hmm. dipping. Like we have, you know, we we um fishing with shrimp. Right. So he's dipping his shrimp in this sauce. In this sauce. Slinging it out into the ocean. It's, just, you're like, it's all on you. And he's like, yo, man, what is that? No. <laughs> It's, I, I don't know why older men I always got to say look and then turn the other mm-hmm. way and look. <laughs> See, um, it's fish guts mm-hmm. with WD-40. You like, um, I'm not using that. As he's pulling out <laughs> right. everything. You right. know, look, red snapper. You know, look at that sheep head. You know, flounder. You know, everybody loves it. He, he tell you everybody loves it. And you, uh-huh. you just have regular shrimp. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and the fish, they must, they like your shrimp. Right. But they don't love them because they right. just nibble on your shrimp uh-huh. and not catching the hook. Right. You'll pull your hook. It's like you have all this nibbled on shrimp. Uh huh. And he's, he's fishing with the same shrimp. Right. He's just dip, re dipping them. Oh, Look, it's crazy. And he's, it's like he has a, a fish store. It's like he's, whatever he's doing, he's like he's throwing his hook in line right into a bowl. Right. Of fish, right? And it's like I'm throwing, trying to throw right next to him. Uh-huh. The fish is like, no, 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 no. You don't have the. Secret <laughs> He's got sauce. like this crack cocaine. For fish. <laughs> and you're just like, hey, I got shrimp. Fuck you, pal. And and like, you know, no, no one wants your shrimp, sir. These are coconut <laughs> shrimp over here. It, it's, it's a weird thing, man. Mm. And and you learn things. Uh, and and there's no racism in fishing, right? One of the only things there's no racism mm-hmm. in fishing. I've actually been on a pier with a guy. It had a SWAT sticker on top of his head. Beautiful. Like, right. Mm-hmm. Straight psh, burnt mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. Mexican guy. On the other end, Muslim dude, mm-hmm. turban on. Right. White guy, regular white dude, mm-hmm. just on the end. Me, another guy. Nobody's catching anything. No. Nobody's catching anything. Mexican dude hooks a shark. Okay. Muslim, SWAT sticker, mm-hmm. regular white guy. All trying to help, help him. him. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it, in our minds, like, if he catches something, then it's, Everyone's everyone going. will yeah, start yeah. catching. And I just sat back and I took the picture. And I said, uh-huh. <laughs> I was like, oh, racist, yeah. mm-hmm. Muslim, mm-hmm. 
white guy, yeah. Mexican, yeah. all catching a shark. Mm-hmm. You know your colors are bad. <laughs> <laughs> and this is this is when you're hungry. This mm. is they're about food. It's about food, now. right? And that the shark comes up, and the the commentary was funny. If I could have recorded the commentary, because I because we were fishing off a pier, so you have to throw down a rope, right, to get the the shark up, right? Yeah. So it, you know to hook him to put around the tail. So you got this one guy. I'm the best roper, <laughs> and I'm like. The white guy would say he's the best roper. Uh huh. Oh. <laughs> it's like, I'm the best roper. Uh huh. And this guy, he can't speak English at all. Mm-hmm. And everybody's assisting him. And it was just, and I'm sitting there in awe. Right. And I'm like, yo, man, this is the best day of fishing. Right. That I, I didn't catch anything. I caught a glimpse at humanity. Right. Is what I caught. But that's, that's, it's stories like that that we need now. That's, that's, right? Yeah, that's all. Right? Yeah. Could we all just like stop everything and get Trump fishing? Could we just do that? Right? Get him and Kim Jong Un in a boat off a pier, something, and just do that. This is if I, if, if I get trapped in Canada, I'm probably not going to be upset. We have lakes. Um, don't you worry about it. Um, I am fine being trapped here because I don't know what the states is looking like right now. Because mm-hmm. two crazy people threaten each other back and forth. I know. I've seen this before. Right. I've seen my aunt and my uncle could only argue back and forth for so right. long. Right. And they're doing it on Twitter. It, yeah. Is this not? Leave that to Andy Richter. Okay. Let him and Ricky Gervais do it. We don't need Trump and Kim Jong Un going, Oh yeah, fuck face. No. We just do stop. You know, though, but it, it's showing, it's showing how well. A Dalton, he called him a, a it, dotard. A dotard. Right. Everybody in the United States was looking at him. Yeah, exactly. I've never seen journalists. No. N- be real it's, news right. anchors. It's this like, one's Kofifi. Bob Costas. <laughs> like, um, adults are like, mm-hmm. I mean, like, they were showing the definition on TV. I'm like, yeah, y'all didn't know what this meant. And, it, <laughs> and then Trump's response, his mm-hmm. only response was, Lil Rocket Man again. Ralph. He added, from Rocket Man, yeah. and then just put little mm-hmm. on the front. The man right. called you a dotal. Right, right, right. Dude, He's you done. you you're in a you're in a different league right now. Yeah. You're you're playing with a man who's who's really smarter than you, mm-hmm. and he just showed you invoking, and yeah. then said, then ostracized your speech at the UN. It's mm-hmm. like, yo, that's not what the UN is for. No, you dunce. Yeah, like, and everybody had to agree, like. Mm-hmm. Oh, we don't want to agree with North Korea, but right. he's actually freaking right. Yeah, exactly. Who knew that the person who picked Dennis Rodman? <laughs> <laughs> Ali, thank you so much for oh, coming down. Thank you, man. The pleasure was all mine. Enjoy, man. Uh, enjoy the rest of uh, your festival, and uh, may the pumpkin spices be plentiful. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. No worries, man. To the listener who doesn't know, we are lounging on couches. True lounge. It's a day. Lo- it's a like a like a you know I don't know what you call this a day bed almost. No, it's just a couch, I guess. Whatever. Yeah. Um, but we were reposed quite romantically. Yeah. Um, it was a couple of years ago. Um, I think you and I were both watching Dave Stone perform. Oh, okay. I think. And uh, old Dave Stone. Where yeah. Were we, where were we watching Dave? <sighs> the catacombs, maybe. Does that sound about right? Oh, at Montreal. Yeah, Montreal. Sorry, it was yeah, yeah it was in Montreal. Yeah, yeah he was up there. Mm-hmm. He was doing a, a new phase unwrapped. I was up right. there. I think he opened for me mm-hmm. at the catacombs. Right. And I think I don't know if he, they were doing new faces there as well. I think so. Okay, I think yeah. I, I think that's what he was on. I think yeah. it was the new faces. My good buddy Dave still. Yeah. yeah. You you're no stranger to Toronto though, right? You've no, been here. You've been no. here a few times. Dave and I have a podcast ourselves now. If you know that. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. We do a podcast called The Boogie Monster. That's the one. Okay. Because I saw this thing go through my feed. I'm like, what? Like, I just saw them retweet. I was like, what the hell is Dave doing now? It's just like, oh, that's awesome. We we fail at trying to talk about the supernatural. Okay. So, oh, yeah. (laughs) This is what I've heard about this, if you you don't mind. It's because people have been telling me about this lovely podcast where you talk about the supernatural. (laughs) And then then it, uh, you you talk for, I don't know, 45 minutes about great uh, wings and grits that you found in the city. And you go, oh, yeah, we're supposed to talk about the Amityville horror. Okay. Uh, yeah, we really. It's really like the kid who didn't do the book report right. bullshit his way through the subject <laughs> in front of the class. And uh, 
I, I always delight when people are like, actually, you got it wrong. We're right. like, we know. Uh-huh. Did you laugh at it? We're or not or good at <laughs> yeah, this. Yeah. Yeah, full disclosure, we're, <laughs> we're bad at this. We're yeah. not going to learn anything. No! This is... We just hope you're entertained. <laughs> right. You don't go to Neil deGrasse Tyson yeah, for yeah, a yeah. tight 20 on shopping. <laughs> Although yeah. he probably could write He probably could jokes. do it. He probably could do it. people can write... Uh, algebraically sound kind right where it's not necessarily funny but the punchline mm-hmm. oh that is that does He's add just, up I picture him at like a chalkboard and it's just filled with like numerics and, and Greek symbols and he gets the end and goes and that's the joke there's some comedians that do that uh, amazingly where they're just they're, they're like mathematically minded but right. approach comedy in a way where like then the, then they get to the end of the bit. You're like, oh, you son of a bitch. You yeah, 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 yeah. And it went around that way and then uh-huh. came back this yes. way. And I get excited because I cannot do that at all. Yeah. We had a, we had a guy, he's, he passed away, sadly, Erwin Barker. I don't know if you ever had the chance I to meet him. Yeah. He was like that guy. Like, yeah. he was just, he had these very, very, like, he would, he would kill in, like, small towns. Yeah. With a bit on cellular mitosis and just like, <laughs> how did you do that? And he's just like, you just tell the joke yeah, and just. It's like, thank God somebody's talking about something else. I know. Something I have no idea about. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, well, let me yeah. have it then. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is like, it, it's, it's, it's good that you have gone from your meandering podcast to my meandering podcast. Cause that's all, we, because my favorite thing is when we have a publicist who joins the guest in yeah. to talk about a very specific thing. Like, this is an actor. He's um, in this movie. Make sure you talk about it. Um, and we end up talking about about uh, you know socks for an hour and a half and and all you can do is are, are you picking this up are you pick- oh it's the publisher's drumming her fingers on the table we have to talk about your project we're yeah. not we're not participating in capitalism <laughs> if you don't promote the project <laughs> promote get make the rich people <laughs> right. promote the project so uh, I take it you and Dave you're anyway I'll be yes. at uh, comedy bar tonight uh, yes. in Victoria tomorrow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> where uh, where do you where do you go after after the festival? Oh, I did some great routing on this one. I go to mm-hmm. Austin, Texas. Okay, <laughs> all right. I have a show Wednesday night in Austin. And okay, Tuesday night in Toronto. Mm-hmm. And this is clearly a tour that sure. I booked myself. Yes, and didn't rely on an agent. <laughs> I don't know if it's called a tour if it you, mm-hmm. you know, if you veer that far away right. from the original location. Mm-hmm. But I go to Austin uh, for a, for a festival. I'm right there Wednesday night, and then a festival. Uh, in Atlanta okay. next weekend. Right. When does this come out? Today? This will, it will probably come out because uh, we're doing two separate junkets. They're probably going to come yeah. out for, uh, Thursday, Friday, somewhere in there. Okay. Yeah. So people will be able to so pick you up there. If I promoted That's right. For tonight, oh, you can. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to stop you from doing anything, guy. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Time Machine. Pilots. Yes. <laughs> I could be playing last Tuesday. That's Tuesday. right. Right. Once you're done killing Hitler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, outside of the stuff, you're obligated to sure. get a Time Machine. That's right. Uh, I had some pretty good shows right. if yes. you wanted to visit. Yes, them. there you go. <laughs> Once, you, once you've paid uh, uh, Donald Trump, uh's dad, to uh, give him a hug, oh, so that we can stop all this. What if we, what if we get to the point where time travel, like they invent it and they take care of all of history, and now there's just t- time travel tour guides that are right. like, oh, well, you might want to visit this. That's right. This period in time is actually surprisingly <laughs> mm-hmm. out of the way. Yeah. People don't know about 1600s in mm-hmm. Venezuela. Was actually, the food was excellent. What? I, uh, I didn't think that bit out too much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get the feeling no matter uh, no matter when in the future people would come back in time, like if they came back to here, mm-hmm. they would still report back to uh, to the future where they live and go, so what was the past like? And go, mm-hmm. they're still racist. You know? Yeah, it's yeah. not going to go away. No. It's going to be it's gonna be the Asian time traveler drivers are bad. Mm-hmm. You know, don't use their intergalactic turn signals enough or right. something. There's, it's going to exist. Mm-hmm. Until we're all blended into one nebulous form of energy, right? Here's here's a question for you because um, one of the, one of the things I uh, that I uh, love about your stuff is that it's 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 always based on personal stuff that uh, that mm-hmm. always kind of comes to you like that. In the current political climate, is that tainting the way that you write right now? Because I will tell you right now, I'm finding it very hard not to write about stupid shit anymore. I'm becoming more and more. This is bugging me. I've been on Twitter for way too long. Why, I'm, why is this infecting I'm me? I'm suffering from the same thing. And I'm, I, for a while, it's like, I oh, you delete it off your phone. So that way, if it's only on your computer, you can it's, just go to it. All right. Information. I'd use it to promote stuff. And right. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to sit here looking at my computer. Right. Your phone's always there. It's mm-hmm. always this reminder. 
And uh, I find myself dipping into those those negative spaces mm-hmm. of, of uh, you know, of like, oh, I've just read it too much and it's not good. I've acti- actively just been deleting accounts right. to curate the feed on Twitter to where mm-hmm. it's... Or in, Instagram's better. It's not as political. Right. I, so I just... But Twitter, it's like, all right, BMX bikes, mm-hmm. uh, some bands, some off-road stuff. Like, only my hobbies and interests. Right. And, like, I'm trying to get anybody, any comedian who has just fallen victim right. to just commenting politically, uh-huh. and not, not even fun... Right. Yeah. And I'm not saying no. stick to stick to comedy. That's right. not what I'm saying at all. Talk about it. But I'm mm-hmm. not going to read your shit on Twitter. Right. Or as a comedian, make it funny. The uh, But in some cases, I don't mind. And it's certainly it's probably because I'm of the same political mind as, as a lot of <laughs> yeah, these guys. It's right. Echo chamber. So yeah. it's, like, it's not benefiting me for you to be like, well, by the way, he's right. bad. Trump's bad. Yeah, I know. What, yeah. What, what, that, yeah. I don't need to. This, I, this is all your content is. I don't yeah. need to listen. I, I know. I get that, but there is something nice when I can wake up in the morning and go, Andy Richter and I think the same way. Okay, I feel good. Yeah, I, but I, I get it. Like it's it, right now. It's a fire hose. It's a fire hose of bad news. Yeah, I would rather hear somebody either with a which there isn't really any kind of counterpoint or somebody like right. Well, wait, no, I'm like. I'm a bit of a contrarian dickhead myself sure. sometimes because mm-hmm. I want to like once in a while be like, eh, but, but right. what about, what about, right. I did a show yesterday and we were, they were talking about the healthcare debate. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I just wish I would hear all these people are so concerned about their healthcare being taken away. I wish I would hear that argument not out of somebody 10 beers deep in right. the comedy show <laughs> and like, you know, coke rim nostrils right, telling exactly. me they're upset about healthcare. Like, what about your personal health yes. care right now? Uh-huh. Like, where's that concern? <laughs> you know, like, uh, but that's just me kind of like, right. man, come on, I want to poke the bear a little bit. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm still on the side of everybody right. else, but like, let's not be complete hypocrites. I right. can't support it when it's hypocritical, when mm-hmm. everybody was either like, what's, what, what's the matter with nonviolent protest? And right. I'm a Nazi puncher. Well, you right. can't be both. You're right. either a Nazi puncher or you're a nonviolent protester. <laughs> right. That's and it. Like, pick one. I'm not yes. saying either one's bad, but you can't be both. <laughs> right. And if you think you're both, I can't support you. Right. So do one or the okay. other. I think we're all saying the same thing. Go out and punch everybody. Yeah. 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 Be, you know, non discerning. <laughs> yes. But the, but the echo chamber of like, you're just saying something mm-hmm. to a bunch of followers that agree with you. Right. And if somebody pops up in your comments that, look, what I disagree, and then mm-hmm. all your followers jump, that's the grossest thing about right. it. I disagree with somebody on Twitter, and then a bunch of other people right. are piling on that person. Exactly. Like, I didn't ask, I don't need your help. No. I got no, no, this. no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're jumping all over somebody just for making a dumb comment. So yeah. Like, well, now I can't even respond to the dumb comments anymore. Right. <laughs> like, uh-huh. once the guy is like beaten to a pulp, you just kind of come over and go, yeah. you are still wrong. And then you just walk I did away. I something the other day where I was like, oh, this is kind of a silly thing. Then mm-hmm. all these people start jumping on, on my behalf. I'm like, I never told you to be rude right. to this guy. Right. I never asked for any of this. The, the problem is, is that we have close proximity to engagement. Right. Yeah. Because like I will see like like Lori Kilmartin take a run at someone. Yeah. And I go, yeah, I'd want to do the same thing. And I have to stop myself going, this is not your fight. Yeah. Stay out of this fight. Let them have it. You can read you it. Know? Read it for sure. But then there's just that creative mind in you where you just go, oh, I got a great tag for this. You yeah. know, as, uh, yeah. Oh, well, do you think we're going to pull out of it? You think like 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 we're in a tailspin right now, so like kind of socially that way. Is it just going to like burn itself out or will we find a way or what do you think? Being a. Uh... Being a pretty misinformed individual, mm-hmm. it's easy to feel doom and gloom. Sure. Um, also, from just some scientific basis, there was, a, I think it was a New York Magazine article from a few months ago, basically like just saying, like, no matter what happens, we're, right. we're fucked. Right. Politically, nuclear, mm-hmm. climate change, yeah, right. whatever. But also pointing out that with, within all these, within the universe, how many planets have been populated and then that population has grown too big right. for its well-being and has decimated itself right. millions and millions of times mm-hmm. throughout the existence of the universe. Right. And my thing is this idea that we're special and we're going to make it and it's like Independence Day mm-hmm. in the movie. But I get to say that because, you know... I get to be a professional comedian, and mm-hmm. I don't have kids. So, all right, good run. Yeah, You're out. Yeah, whatever. Okay, had fun. Yes, use it. Maybe even if you do believe in that, use it as a motivating factor 
to like literally live each day like it's your last. Now, right. Don't be an asshole to other people about mm-hmm. it, but like, wow, this might be. I remember after nine eleven, there's more people like all of a sudden in stand up. There's people like, well, I always want to try comedy, and right. uh, the world might be ending. So this really is not nearly as scary, right? As anything I thought it was before, <laughs> right? You know, skyscrapers collapsing. Out. Right. That's scary, and that happens now. Yeah, I could do five minutes at the open mic. Exactly. So if anything, let, let <laughs> don't worry about pull out. Let it be an inspiration to make mm-hmm. pursue the things you wanted to pursue in right. life instead of being scared of it all, or, or you know, right. No. Oh well, and guess what? We've now got time. The publicist has thumbed, uh, well, drummed her fingers, it. and like we got the thing down. Chop. So, uh, Kyle, We're getting into it though. I know. Good okay, one. so next time you're in town, we'll have you in the studio, yeah. and uh, we'll have this conversation. And you can bring Dave if you want. We'll get old Dave. Up yeah, there. yeah. He's done. He's done this show twice. So yeah. you got it. You got to start laughing. He's already. He already lives in the van, so he's already. Okay. Yeah. Good. If, if shit goes down. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I'm working on it. Uh, Kyle, uh, best of luck in uh, in this festival in everything else. You in your ill planned out travels in the next <laughs> little while. And uh, and what's the name of the podcast again? The Boogie Monster. The Boogie Monster. All yeah. right. Awesome, Kyle. Thank you so much. Thank you. All the best, brother. One of um, one of my buddies uh, who has been on the show quite a few times, Derek Forge, he was on um, Last Comic Standing and uh, all kinds of fun stuff like that. He uh, worked at a, a television show where um, the prime minister showed up. It's like a talk show, and this is before he was prime minister. He was like still campaigning, and. You know, he's a young guy, you know, Justin Trudeau, he's, you know, they always bag on him for being like young and with it. Like he's doing like, you know, uh, you know, Instagram chats and stuff like that. Right. And so, uh, he was going through people going, Hey, could you take a selfie? And he's like, yeah. And he, no matter what the phone was, he would grab it. Wouldn't even do like what we did with the, where you face it. He just go boom, backwards snap, and then hand it to him. My buddy looked at him and went, dude, you have serious selfie Kung Fu. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then that man became the leader of the free world. Not Derek, but Justin did, obviously. That's that's it. Um, so you won't be able to hear anything, but okay. we're just going to record into this. And uh, how are you? Uh, you want to you talk there for a second? Yes, test. There test, you go. Test, hello. And it, yes, it is recording. Okay. Um, I was... Uh, so how's your day been? It's been okay. Yeah? I, I kind of just got up about an hour ago. <laughs> yeah. How, uh, uh, how's your festival been? It's been good. Yeah. I, I started off with uh, four shows with Ali Wong, mm-hmm. and I've been on tour with her like all year. Right, and that's been nice. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's been good. Sold out theaters, mm-hmm. and then tonight, tomorrow, I have uh, my own shows. Right, where I'm worried that people are even going to show up. <laughs> so. <laughs> I was basically begging people. That's right. I was like, hey, just please come. Like, if one row of you come, uh-huh. I'll sell out my shows. Well, uh, better go postering. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite thing. I, I absolutely like. I have one show I do myself, yeah. and I used to poster all over the city. Oh, yeah. And I just realized, you know, there's Facebook. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fuck that. Three yeah, posters. Yeah. That's all I'm doing. Yeah. So yeah, so <laughs> Todd, hopefully. three posters. Van Allen. That's yeah. all I do. Uh, what, so where are you based out of? Uh, I live in Los Angeles. LA, now. okay. Yeah, yeah. And, uh. Originally from San Francisco. San Francisco? Yeah. Which is one of my favorite cities in the U.S. Oh, it's great. It used to, uh, it's my, my top two, uh-huh. uh, it, and there were only two, uh-huh. uh, were in New York and Chicago because I'd never been to San Francisco. Yeah. And, uh, as soon as I went to San Francisco, I went, oh, move over you two. There's, oh, uh, yeah. there's competition. It's, Oh yeah, gorgeous out there. Yeah, it's right? beautiful. And uh, and I I'd always kind of heard about it, like you know, like um, listening to Greg Proops's podcast and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Like he always goes on about San Francisco and stuff. And uh, we now have um, like a couple of friends down there, yeah, yeah that we've met, um, who we actually met in Belgium. Huh. And then uh, and then when we went to San Francisco, we hung out with them for a bit. But like, oh, nice. it's just so gorgeous. Yeah, uh, a lot of hills. They don't tell you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You sort of forget those like cop chasing shows from like the 70s where oh, you go, right. oh shit, yeah, there's hills. <laughs> there's real hills yeah. out there. Yeah. I watched, we were on our way, we were walking up, I don't know, is like our 85th hill of the day uh-huh. uh, in some residential area. And this woman was walking her dog, like a big dog. And the dog hit the corner and just sat down and looked at every one of us and went, fuck it, I am not moving. <laughs> and like the, the woman is like, come on. He's like, nope, I'm done. <laughs> Yeah. Like when the dogs give up, yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem. Yeah, 
how long were you in uh, San Francisco? You, you grew up oh, there? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I pretty much grew up there mm-hmm. and started comedy there about 15 years ago. Okay. Or something like that. Right. And uh, yeah, I went there. Uh, it's a good scene. There's a good history, too, of, of comedy mm-hmm. in, in San Francisco. A lot of, even a lot of people in my, my uh, class uh, are, are doing really well right mm-hmm. now. Who's uh, who's in that? Uh, well, it would start off maybe with Al Mandrigal mm-hmm. and uh, Kamal Bell, uh, Hassan Minaj is mm-hmm. one of the younger guys. Right. Ali Ali even started probably four years after me, mm-hmm. maybe even five years. Right. And uh, she's doing very well, obviously. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch. There's a, there's a, there's a lot. Right. Um, a lot of TV writers and mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah. I did one show in San Francisco. Oh, where? It was at the laundromat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The brainwash. Yes. Yeah, that's where we all start. Mm -hmm. Everybody, everybody that I mentioned started there. I could not believe how supportive that room is. Uh uh, How also, as much as they are supportive, uh, they will not suffer fools gladly. Yeah. If they don't like you, you know. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. and uh, my favorite thing is that, oh, we have a new guy, so you know what? He gets six minutes instead of the usual four. I'm uh-huh. like, oh, okay, because I just saw him eat it, and they uh-huh. hated him. Uh-huh. Okay, yeah. let's do this. But, then you but it's it so in, fun. You put it in perspective. Mm-hmm. There's people doing their laundry. Right. And, you know. and getting food. Yeah, and getting it's food. It's a restaurant. Yeah. It's yeah, like, yeah. oh, come on. <laughs> is, that, is that, like... There, there's something gorgeous about things like that, like mm-hmm. where it becomes that thing and like the community kind of kind yeah. of like rallies around it. What is the weirdest place that you performed in outside of that place? Huh. You, you know, in Los Angeles, I do a lot of backyards. Mm-hmm. There's definitely a lot of backyard shows. I did a show in a little garage. Right. A lot of people just put on their own shows. Mm-hmm. And people come out, like these, whatever you want to call it, alternative shows mm-hmm. or things like that. Right. But uh, the weirdest place, ah, geez, I think the weirdest place was probably Hong Kong. Okay. I, I performed. That's a big venue. Yeah. <laughs> I performed at an Italian restaurant for okay. Australian expats in Hong Kong. Okay. You know. <laughs> that's a culture. That's yeah, just yeah. a cultural booty base. Okay. Yeah, too much. Where are you going? Hong Kong. Am I performing for Chinese people? Oh, no. You're in an Italian restaurant. Oh, it's Italians then. No, no. Just wait. <laughs> right. There's more. You also get Australian expats. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what it was. Right. And uh, it didn't go well. No. No. <laughs> It did not go well. <laughs> did you like Hong Kong at least? It's nice. Yeah, it's nice. There, there's a thing about because I'm I'm Filipino. Right. I don't know if you can tell by my voice, but I'm Filipino. <laughs> right now, we just lost all of the racist listeners. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but in in Hong Kong and like parts of Asia, you know, mm-hmm. Filipinos are working in the hotels. I mean, right. Yeah. I'm just like here too. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, hotels and like you know maids and mm-hmm. drivers and things like that. So they have a they have a particular idea of Filipinos. Right. So I go out there as a Filipino American. They just, they're like, oh yeah, we know Filipinos. We right. have a lot working for us. <laughs> it's just kind of awkward. <laughs> right. And then as you're standing on stage going, well, not much has changed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I am working for you this evening. <laughs> yeah, right. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, th- that is, that's one of the, the perks of the job. Like, do you get, like, is this your first time to Toronto? Like, it is. Uh, I've been here a few times. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I've been yeah. here a few times with, with a Filipino comedy tour. Okay. Now, yeah. who's, who all is on that uh, with you? Uh, well, uh, I, the guys are, uh, Ron Jossel mm-hmm. is a Toronto guy. Great friend of mine. Yeah. Friend great. of the show, Ron yeah. Jossel. Love yeah. him. He's so He funny. and I fight so much about Gwen Stefani. Really? Oh, yeah. On, on, if he, she's pretty or not? He loves her. Yeah. Sure. Loves her. He would, uh, I don't care who his girlfriend was, that, <laughs> like, if they were standing on a cliff and Gwen Stefani came over and said, Hi, Ron, I'd like to spend the rest of my life with you, uh, push, yeah, yeah. Be, she would be gone. Oh, really? And then Gwen Stefani would, and him would, like, go off into the sunset. <laughs> okay. Um, and, uh, I have, I, it's not her I have a problem with. It's just uh-huh. like when people said, Oh, there's a great new ska band. And I listened to him, like, This is not a ska band. Oh, it's right. Horrible. Yeah. Okay. So right. you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, you you know ska. I know some. Okay. I know okay. some. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't get my uh, checkerboard uh, personality uh, without the, uh, my perspective. The, in the eighties, were you? 
I was not a rude boy in the eighties. Okay, okay. No, uh, but I have since I have since gone back and listened to like Jamaican ska, like yes. the old like the That's the nice. big band like Desmond Decker yeah. and the Aces, and you know okay. you know Don Drummond and all that stuff. I think my favorite is English Beat and Fishbone. Oh and yeah. all those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have so my wife's Italian, and I have found Italian ska. Really? Yeah. Huh. And it's great. There really? are so many great bands. In fact, when my wife and I got married, we did like the iPod DJ uh-huh. where we just put it on. And, uh, I said, well, you know, you're, you've got, we had two or three like only in Italian songs for like the old people uh-huh. from her side of the family. So they come up. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we played like, uh, well, like one of the Italian ska songs that we like? Nice. And she's like, yeah, let's do that. It'll be kind of fun. And so we put this thing on and it just starts rocking like the dance floor starts getting filled and then i stopped and, and i said no one really checked the lyrics oh, like man. i wonder if this is like right wing fucking <laughs> like, yeah. like is this just like yeah. speeches of, of mussolini that <laughs> yeah. they're just going yeah. they're like oh no i was like no it was fine i was talking about a cupboard full of dreams okay good phew okay what's the name of the band uh that one it wasn't Persiana jones there was a i'll, I'll get you the name afterwards okay. um they're really good yeah they're fun do you like you like Scott? I, I get in. I get into it. I get into different genres mm-hmm. of music. Uh, there's a band in the Philippines that is. Their name is Putreska. Okay. And Putreska. Right. It kind of means like fuck your mother. Right. So, like, <laughs> but they were good, and they were like early '90s. Right. This yeah. is the other thing I love about ska bands uh-huh. is the. Uh, in DNA need to put ska somewhere in the yeah, name of your yeah, band yeah, right. so people know. <laughs> right, right, right? Right, right, right. Like no other genre yeah. does it. Like, you know, the Waltz brothers. Like yeah. no one does that. <laughs> yeah. Like what are your what's your name? The Scorpions. No one know we're metal. Better put in metal scorpions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let them know. Yeah. That's like a, a Asian comedy shows. Mm-hmm. Always like to use Asian like Imagination right. comedy uh-huh. show, or but then, uh, yeah, okay. So that's the fun. That's the fun of the genre, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, there's a there's a lesbian uh, comedy show here in Toronto. I think it's still going called the Dykes of Hazard, uh-huh. yeah, right? So great. it's like you go, oh, isn't that cute? Yeah, that is good wordplay. Name. That's fine. Yeah, that's a good name. That's right. Uh, okay, so Ron Jossel's on this tour with yeah, you. Yeah, Ron, and there's Keith Pedro, another uh, guy I know. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, they, there's a lot of Toronto guys. There. Yeah, younger cat named ernie vicente god um, jesus okay you know there's really can, can you name someone i haven't seen in like the past two weeks come on yeah you're going you're going through my facebook friends now i know i think there's <laughs> just a handful of us mm-hmm. and and then so we just naturally just get together and right. do this little tour every that's once awesome while. though yeah it's fun yeah um <laughs> is uh, how far how far you, have you taken the tour uh around toronto yeah, yeah or no i mean like you know worldwide like, oh, where, where uh, do you guys go uh for ali wong uh no for the um uh, uh oh, for, for the Filipinos of comedy uh we haven't done that for like a couple years couple years actually now? but um I mean we did about besides Toronto we probably did about six U S cities okay you know we do right. a whole weekend there or sure. something like that yeah yeah and how about Allie where's she taking you uh pretty much we go to two cities a month mm-hmm. since last November and um it, like last week we were in um. Where were we? Oh, Houston and mm-hmm. Dallas. And then. You were there last week? Just last week. Yeah. So this is like post hurricane. Yeah. Holy cow. So. Yeah. I ate it there. <laughs> At, uh, Houston show. Mm-hmm. I think people wanted, I should have probably mentioned something, <laughs> but I didn't. And I think people might have been waiting for it, but there was definitely a certain kind of like sadness. Right. In the air. Mm hmm. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't do my job. <laughs> Ever, you ever eat fish sticks? <laughs> Get to the hurricane! Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, these people are, like, rebuilding their fences. Right. And uh, they're going to listen about my mm-hmm. relationship story. Right, exactly. <laughs> so Tinder's weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but that's, but, like, there's two schools of thought on that, right? Like, like, like there's, like, you either cancel the show yeah. so that people can kind of sort themselves out, or you go, no, someone needs a laugh. Yeah. Here, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, that's why, like... uh like I'm sure there were open mics filled on September 12th. Oh sure. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Uh, and going up with your notepad. So what's in the news? Right. And, yeah. I actually got started after September 11th. Did you? Yeah. I, I felt like I wanted to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I should. Or right. Something. What was what was the what was the draw? Uh, to comedy. To, uh, yeah. 
Uh, well, other other things. than watching two planes fly into the <laughs> twin towers, like you know, that wasn't that which wasn't where it's where a lot of people get their comedy start. <laughs> yeah, actually, I can write better than that. Come on. Actually, I was having horrible panic attacks for, mm-hmm. for uh, uh, months, mm-hmm. and then my the therapist at the time said, <laughs> "Try to do something out of your norm, right? Just to you know, uh, get yourself out of your own." You know, comfort zone. Right. And then it was stand up. Mm-hmm. And then the planes hit and then stand up. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I just love picturing your therapist going, I meant woodworking. Yeah, yeah. You know, anything else. Just something just, like yeah. that. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so when you were, um, when you were starting out, uh, and do, you know what I'm going to do? This is, this is something because I don't know what your junket day has been like. Okay. And this is like sort of like the first kind of mass one that we've done. Oh yeah. So like, okay. I was like, let's have some like questions. Oh, let's do this. So, um, uh, this, here we go. So I think we've got, yeah. Okay. That's a vacuum cleaner. Okay. That's right. Which is exactly what we need when we're recording yeah. a podcast. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's perfect. We're going to put you in a lobby, Todd. It's fine. Uh-huh. Don't worry about it. Um, so uh, we, uh, we covered how did you get your start, and this is what triggered this one, because that was my okay. first question. That was my first kind of junket question, if we're going to go into that. Um, what is your best memory on stage? Best memory on stage? Mm-hmm. Um, I'd have to probably say... Uh, there was an outdoor fest. There used to be the Oddball Comedy Festival. Okay. Um, that was maybe like four or five years ago, and it was my first like big outdoor show mm-hmm. with probably thousands of people sitting on the grass. Right. Usually, outdoor shows are no good. Nope. Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> this one was good, and I felt I felt like a kind of like a rock star on mm-hmm. that one. Kind of like one, right? Although we were on the side stage and the major headliners were on the big stage. Right, right, yeah, but, yeah. But still, I felt like, oh, this is great. Yeah, yeah. yeah I can think festivals like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that one in particular, but also uh, there's one in San Francisco. Um, uh, there's another festival in San Francisco, Outside Lands. Okay. Where there's just three days and the com- you have a comedy tent. Mm-hmm. That was my first comedy tent. And that was a lot of fun. Right. But uh, I, 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 I love that. Um. This is one of the things that I, <laughs> I, about outdoor shows, is uh-huh. they're the biggest bait and switch. Yeah. Because like all it takes is just one to go good. Uh-huh. And then you go, oh, they're all going to be like this. Yeah. This will right. be fine. And no matter how many you bomb, someone goes outside, you go, oh, but there was that one. Yeah. Okay, I'll do it. And then you're standing in a campsite with 18 people throwing bottles at you. And you just, <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, okay. So that's your best memory on stage. What's your worst? Uh, I think I, uh, the, the, the Houston one. No, or the no, Hong, Kong Hong Kong one. Kong for sure. What because was it about that? Like why, why were they well, not I was buying getting it? heckled by, by these, uh, Australian expats. They, they do that. Yeah. And they yeah, do that. They do and I that. I didn't know that. Oh, okay. I found that out. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, I just got really upset and I approached them afterwards mm-hmm. and they're like, yeah, that's. They, they, just have, they, they that. yeah, that's what we do. Right. I was, we so, enjoyed it. Yeah. I was like, oh, well, I, could you shut up? <laughs> yeah. So once you figure that out, yeah. it's fine because I did, I did the Melbourne Comedy Festival mm-hmm. in Australia and they had this one room, uh, that was also part of the festival where it was like an open mic and you go in so like you, like the, the acts from that night would come in and try. So they also had local people and that sort of thing. And, for whatever reason, they were polite in the shows. Like if you paid for like the actual show, like the theme show, mm-hmm. they would behave and they'd be fine. <laughs> but you go to this thing and I'm just, I'm watching the first two acts go up and go, oh my God, like, yeah. like no one's getting a word in edgewise. Really? But we had had like, there was like three or four Toronto guys here and like, we're just like, this is as bad as one of the open mics we had here. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, so just go into that mode. Mm-hmm. And like, yeah, so just fight, fight, fight. Mm-hmm. And so you started shutting people down, shutting people down. Mm-hmm. And, and just like you, when they come up after the show, go, you were great. And you're like, why didn't you shut up? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, uh, I had one guy that I shut down, shut down. And, uh, he he turns to he met me afterwards. I'm at the bar. I'm just trying to get. I'm trying trying to drink this out of me. Like mm-hmm. I'm just like so filled with rage because I had five minutes worth of jokes and I only got two because I'm dealing with this chowder head. Mm-hmm. And I go and he comes over. and Goes you should have come at me more. 
Oh, wow. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. what? Yeah. He goes, yeah, you didn't shut me down. Yeah. And I go, you, so what should I have done? Called you a fucking asshole? And he's like, yeah, that would have worked. He goes, <laughs> I'm doing it now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so that's good. Who, uh, who would you say your influencers are? And if you say Ron Jossel, this interview is over. This is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> influencers. I mean, I like... I think a lot of my friends are, are, are the ones. I mean, I used to say stuff like, uh, you know, there's always like the big three. Mm-hmm. Like, you could say Bird, mm-hmm. Louis. Um, but watching Allie and her work ethic is mm-hmm. incredible. And a lot of my friends, like, uh, Shang Wang and Louis Katz, these mm-hmm. guys are, um, they're all doing well. They're all writing on shows right now. And they're just real funny. Right. Real, real funny. Like, I, I, I started just thinking about the guys in my circle. Right. They're the ones that I really like enjoy watching mm-hmm. and, and, and get inspired from. Right. Um, so you mentioned Allie and her work ethic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What's your writing process? <laughs> well, okay. So, real quick, so, well, so first of all, yeah. I love when I ask someone that yeah. and their first response is, a, <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like, I can't wait. Well, okay. For example, Allie's. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she'll do an hour right show and have another hour show later on that night she'll record the first hour right listen to it uh-huh. during the the intermission or with during the break. the break make notes and then do those notes on the second hour right me i'll do a set <laughs> and then i'll drink in between uh-huh <laughs> and then wait to go on the next set right but so yeah <laughs> I, I try to do like um, morning writing mm-hmm. for sure, and then uh, a lot of writing on stage. Right. And I think that's I, I find that a little easier mm-hmm. you know, these days. It's I, I still write everything word for word though. Oh really? Yeah. And you just let you put it down. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, I'm so glad they chose now to clean. I am yeah. so glad. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I'm gonna help them afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> hey, good. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, he's so nice. He came yeah. here with his own sponge. Um, yeah, like I, there's the writing about it. I, I'm, I'm amazed that you write it all down word for word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's so it like do, do you allow yourself departures? Yeah, or, yeah, okay. yeah. When I'm working on stuff, for right. sure, and then then write it down and then edit it down mm-hmm. and trim the fat, mm-hmm. make sure there's good twists and everything. Right. You know. That's that's the way I like to do it. Nice. Some people can write, uh, just do it off the cuff. Yes. Just bullet points, and then I, I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, there's tricks to make it more conversational when you're, even when you're writing it out. Right. But, uh, <laughs> I just yeah. picture your your writing going turns to audience in brackets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Question mark. Wait for appreciative nods. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, did you ever do any acting or anything like that? Like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, for sure. So maybe that's probably part of it, part of the, of your of your regimented writing. Oh yeah, right? I think so. Yeah, I do. I do some acting now. I'm on a show um, that's going to be premiering in December on TBS. Mm-hmm. It's called The Dress Up Gang. Okay. Hopefully, it comes out here. Uh, I, I think we get TBS. Okay. Pretty sure we do. Yeah. 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 In fact, I know we have because I've seen Atlanta Brave games on TV. Oh, okay. So yeah. Okay. So we totally get that. Okay. Um, so what's the premise of the show? Um, well, it's actually, uh, my actual roommates are, are the main characters mm-hmm. and they created the show. Uh, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of like a leave it to beaver meets Napoleon Dynamite. Okay. Something, re- it's really weird. All right. It's, it's produced by the same. I don't think it sounds that way at all. <laughs> It's produced by the same people, the Absolutely Productions, mm-hmm. that, that do Tim and Eric and Eric Andre show. Right. Like, so it's, uh, it's different. It's, it's weird. But it's, um, I think it's real funny. The, the, the neighbor is Andy McDowell. Okay. I remember Andy McDowell. Yeah, yeah, of course. And she's, she's great. Mm-hmm. And then it's basically a bunch of, uh, people that there's a father figure, uh, that sleeps on a couch. Mm hmm. And um, 
God, it's so hard to explain that I'm not doing it justice. But <laughs> anyways, they meet the way they meet me is they meet me at McDonald's eating by myself. Okay. And the whole that whole episode is about you don't eat a burger by yourself because it'll make people feel sad. Okay. Um, that you're alone. <laughs> right. So they go in a group. They see me alone, and that's how I get in the show. It's it's all I don't know. It, <laughs> trust me, it's funny. <laughs> it, 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 it's funny. <laughs> that's the best byline yeah, I've ever yeah, heard for I a know. show. Trust me, it's funny. Yeah, it's it's gonna be good. It's like like just just in the description of it, it's like uh-huh. it, like it it's it's going to be sort of like. It has that sort of like it's always sunny in Philadelphia vibe yeah, to it, or yeah, like yeah. Portlandia or that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, right. And there's like, because we've we've kind of broken tape on that. Uh-huh. Like it, it offers a lot more kind of Mac. I mean, like, do you do you find now that comedy has sort of like it's it's I don't want to say it's become overly niche. It's almost like fetishized mm-hmm, in mm-hmm. that people can find whatever they want. Oh yeah, and and get to that thing like that's yeah. like like we're seeing so much comedy right now. Yeah, but I think that's speaks more to our consumption. Sure, than yeah. like you go back to like I want to see a lesbian comedy show. Go to the Dykes of mm-hmm. uh, the Dykes of Hazard. Go to the Filipino comedy show. Go mm-hmm. to like you can get the things that you want, whether it's like very scripted or very animated or very you know whatever. Yeah. Right? That's the thing. I think that's the idea now that all these companies are just putting out content Mm because it'll find the audience the audience will find it right yeah yeah. so it's the reverse of supply and demand yeah 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 yeah. just all kinds of stuff out Mm -hmm. there there's so many channels (laughs) it's like you don't even know half of the distribution channels that are out there like it takes like you go what are you on oh i'm on moby Oh, what what the hell is that? He goes, oh, that's UPS's content channel. Like, what? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) If Amazon can do it, UPS can. The Brown Channel. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, (laughs) How um, uh, how how do you find LA? Like, how do you find like like working in 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 that city? It's and making that your home. It's good only if you're working, right? Like, if you're not working, then it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's it's not easy to get around. It's not aesthetically pretty. Mm-hmm. I mean, the beaches are nice and stuff, but right. I don't know. It doesn't really feel like home unless you're, unless you're working. Right. And so this past year has been good. Mm-hmm. Who knows what next year is going to be? You know? Right. But yeah, I like it. I mean, I and all my friends there are are comedians mm-hmm. from San Francisco. So right. Yeah, a small community there. Who, um, if you could work with one person. Every night of the week. Mm. Who would it be? Oh, wow. Um, Jeez. One person. One person. And again, say Ron Jossel, and this interview is over. (laughs) Uh, uh, Maybe uh, Steve Martin? Sure. I'll say Steve Martin. I didn't know you played a banjo. Yeah, I played a banjo, too. Do you? Yeah. No way! I've been playing for like, yeah, only about eight years. Have you done it on stage yet? Uh, I tried it once, okay. but I felt like it was uh, kind of disrespectful to the instrument. <laughs> <laughs> but I play like all that old time music stuff. Mm-hmm. So I always pictured uh, playing with Steve Martin, right. music with Steve Martin. Right. And I don't know if he would do any stand up, but right. just, I don't know. I don't think I he does anymore. Awesome. No. I don't think so. I think it's all banjo. Yeah. Uh, but I, I guarantee you there are people in his audience going, maybe tonight's the night. Yeah. yeah maybe yeah. when he takes off the jacket, <laughs> yeah. puts the arrow on his head. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. I'm sure in between songs, he mm-hmm. probably says something. Oh, yeah. His stage banner is going to be the yeah. best written stuff you're ever going to yeah. hear. <laughs> That's right. I think so. He's mm-hmm. a hero for sure. Yeah. Um, last question I have for you. Uh-huh. Um, who is someone uh, out there right now that you think to yourself, um, people got to know about this person? Hmm. Who is who is your person right now where you just go, more people got to know about this person? Oh, geez. Um, I'm going to say um, my buddy Chris Garcia. Okay. Um, and he's, he's had some... Uh, he has success. Mm-hmm. Uh, Comedy Central, and I think he was on uh, This American Life, okay. on NPR, and things like that. But he's a, a great comedian, and also a great writer. Mm-hmm. And uh, one day he's going to have his own TV show, I'm nice. sure. 
and hopefully he puts me on it. Right. <laughs> yeah. He's going to be asking you to get on yours. Oh, yeah, maybe. He's so. like, Here's the idea. Yeah. I'm eating a chicken sandwich alone in <laughs> yeah. Wendy's. Yeah, Wendy's. How about it? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, no, Wendy's is a happy place. <laughs> That's how we're going to do it. Um, Kevin, yes. thank you. Thank you so much yeah, for coming by. Yeah, uh, appreciate it. Next time you're in town, um, lose Ron Jossel for an hour. Okay. Come by. We'll come by the studio. We'll have like a, like a proper convo. Okay. Actually, you know what? You could... You know, bring Ron, and then you can mediate the argument we're eventually going to get into. I was like, no, Chris, it's like, you got the deciding vote, Kev. (laughs) Pick your words wisely. That'll be it. Um, Thank you for coming to Toronto. We love having you here, and uh, best of luck with the rest of the fest. Thank you very much. All right, brother. See you. All right. Hi, I'm here with uh, (laughs) DJ. You know, this has actually happened to me like three times. DJ Mosner is here, and uh, guess what we just did? We just had a started lovely... recording. Yeah, we had. I looked over and went, "God damn it!" <laughs> so let me ask you this: How was your festival? It's been really it's good. It's going great. Okay, so it's quick, been great. so quick recap. Yes. You moved here. That was stressful. You're doing a special. I asked you uh, about improv and sketch. You said you started at 16. I went, "What?" And you went, "Yeah." I went, "Nah." And you went, "Yeah." Mm-hmm. And then uh, we I talked about like how uh, you were a, a misogynist asshole when you started out, <laughs> and then that's kind of tapered off. And I suggested that maybe you should still run with that and then right. we both agreed that there's no misogyny in the industry and there's uh, absolutely no room for satire wow. have I, have I, have I, did I get everything the right? the media gets it exactly right exactly what I said on the nose exactly. once again yes you uh, can use that as a pull quote I will you, she was a misogynist asshole <laughs> yes. and then we agreed there's no misogyny in the industry anymore <laughs> certainly my yeah. life mandate um, no yeah just kind of uh, when I talk about kind of the things, yeah, that I like in comedy now, super surreal, weird, mm-hmm. fun bits, and I guess a reference to my right. previous work was when mm-hmm. I was 16 and how I really wanted to be one of the boys because I was right. a teenager and I thought right. that was super important mm-hmm. and how my comedy is so the complete complete opposite of that now and how right. much I value sincerity in comedy. Yeah. I love sincerity. Yeah. But even and, and to the point that I was trying to make before I realized, oh, Christ, hitting record might be cool. Hitting record is um, very chill. Within, like, when the, like, the acts you mentioned, like Chris Locke, Roy Scovel, you know, Sarah Hennessy, mm-hmm. uh, all of those people have very, very comedically sincere, mostly, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Very abstract mm-hmm. takes on comedy with slight takes of satire. The satire becomes mm-hmm. an element, but it's not the thing where you're suddenly leaving an audience going... Is there? Like, yeah, there's do, like, no shadow of a doubt of what they're and attempting I, to say. I think, sadly, because that that is the myself. I I love doing satirical stuff, mm-hmm. but you really have to lay down the groundwork these days if you're going to do that, mm-hmm. so that people know. Oh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that oh, he's pretending. Totally. Like he's he's not that that he is making reference well, yeah. to. He is that. I guess. Yeah. I mean, that's what proper satire is. Mm-hmm. But like we were talking about, you know, um, how satire died in the bastardization, yes. bastardization of it in Family Guy. That people right. like satire is just me being like, I'm gonna tell a, a like a rape joke right. ironically, right. and you're like, right. just fucking don't. How about right. you just don't instead? Yeah. You know. There. Uh, yeah. There. It, whenever I see a guy, it's. It's like it's the equivalent of a white guy saying, "Why can't I say the N word?" Yeah, you know, it's like as well, soon as I see yeah. a young comic going, "Oh, I've got the perfect take on a rape joke." First of all, you don't. You don't have the experience of wherewithal for mm. it. And the first question I ask is, "And what's your personal experience with it?" Yeah. Well, I mean, right? yeah. I mean, I don't want to equate different oppressions. I think talking about like uh, and stuff in regards to race and stuff in regards to sexual assault, it's like they're both such slippery and individual topics. I think right. certainly talking about sexual assault, like if you, if you want to make a joke to your own experience, that's great. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of comedians um, think that their intention is enough when their reception right. is equally as important. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just true of everyday life. Right. Uh, and I think, you know, when comedians try and like fudge it, that's because they really think the joke is so funny that, you know, even mm-hmm. if someone thinks it's going to be this, but I guess you know it's an age-old argument of is a comedian responsible for the response of their audience, um, like predicting and playing right. to that? Yes or no? I'm not sure. However, they are responsible to deal with how it changes the room for the next comedian or how right. they're going to react to your next couple jokes exactly. or you know what it means for your support overall as a comedian. Mm-hmm. These are all things that I think like yeah, these are your problems. I love that you're thinking of the next act. <laughs> I'm just I think like it's super important. Bury that asshole well, yeah. and then you know, I, yeah, no. Go. I hate that. I hate that. I never want anyone to do it to me. And honestly, I was on. So I was on a podcast earlier this right. week with um, Kyle Kinane and Ali Sadiq, and they're two 
two like veteran, amazing, amazing mm-hmm. comedians. Oh, you were on the Beaverton. Yeah, the That's Weekly right. Report. Yes. It was mm-hmm. really, really fun. It was a live recording at Second City, and they are fantastic. Right. They're just amazing comedians, and they're just lovely dudes. And they they did, even though they're way more experienced than I am, they made did everything possible to make me feel right. like comfortable out there, just intuitively. And yeah. so I think good comedians do do mm-hmm. that. You know, you should. I mean, because it, you you need to know mm-hmm. that everyone's there is part of the same show, mm-hmm. and so it doesn't make sense for someone to go running off and and destroy a room, mm-hmm. either good or bad, and go. We, now you deal with the mess. Right. I know? mean, yeah, I feel like in those cases, especially if it's like destroying them for the better, like your killer sure, killer's Sure, absolutely. Because then that can only make the next exactly. person better. But if you are just, you know, dying yeah, or yeah. like are doing something so controversial that no one wants to listen anymore. Mm-hmm. Then someone has to spend their set winning back. That's when a right. good host is super key. Mm-hmm. And I also just think like that, those um, looking out for each other on stage, it extends to off stage. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of dudes I know. So we're talking about like a bunch of shitty dudes who do rape jokes and shit. Sure, of course. But there's a lot of amazing dudes who are mm-hmm. amazing comedians who are wonderful dudes uh, who want women and uh, like people of other marginalized identities to feel good on stage and off. Mm-hmm. And I think like, you know, extending that by being like, what does it look like to take care of people who are on a lineup? Um, right. Of like a book show. I'm not saying like every open mic you have to mm-hmm. go around and like, you know, make sure everyone's got a cup of cocoa right. or something. Yeah, but, exactly. You know, making sure that everyone's having a good time, especially right. if there's only one or two women on a lineup, which exactly. in this day and age, bah humbug. Yeah. Why, why only two or three to a 10 right. person lineup? We need more. The So when I'm curating my show, which mm-hmm. is Write em Up here in Toronto. Very nice. Uh, it's the funnest show in T.O. Make sure you come and see it every <laughs> first Saturday at Comedy Bar. Yeah. Um, the The premise of the show is i host five comics come up they do stand up i have a team of writers at the side and they write roast jokes on cue cards about everything they've seen and then i collect the (laughs) cue cards and read them verbatim uh so it provides uh emotional distance and anonymity from Mm -hmm. what they're saying and it's all good nature because it's a it's a small community it's a big community here in toronto but it's small in that everyone knows each other yeah yeah so unless there is some really bad blood that i do not know about Mm -hmm. It's it's going to be all good natured and stuff like that and things that happen in the moment. And when I'm curating that show as a middle aged white man, I sit there and go, I don't need to see more of me on this stage. Mm-hmm. So I do my best to like, yes, I want to bring on you know my friends, but it's not like that everywhere. I make sure that there is uh, a strong representation of women, uh, people who are non white, people who are non straight, mm-hmm. and just to provide also new comics to come through and oh, say totally. let's try and this that's so, and so good i think like there's a lot of people uh, i think the point especially about bringing up new comics is great because i think a lot of like uh, people who produce one-off shows or mm-hmm. monthlies or who are bookers right they kind of are like well you know they're not my buds and i don't see them at my shows so i don't know that they exist it's like it is your job to go see shows. Yeah. Go to all women's festivals yeah. and find three new people mm-hmm. of the 40 people in the lineup yeah. that you can put on your shows. I, I just feel like it's really like we're making it so easy and right. anyone who's making excuses at this point, especially because so many dudes call themselves feminists, but I'm like, and then what? Like, right. and what are you doing? Exactly. You know? um, it's one thing to be like, I'm so, I love women, but it's another mm-hmm. thing to be like, what does it mean that you every week reserve a minimum two spots on your every whatever weekly monthly whatever every time you do your show you reserve two spots for women and even if four five six sixteen twenty five women say they're busy right you keep going yeah. until you find one and that's yeah. just your mandate for yes. yourself yeah like i i booked a show i did a monthly back in montreal called joke town and um the cast is of 12 it'd be always minimum 50 percent mm-hmm. female identifying non-binary right. um players right and sometimes it was tough because women are busy yes (laughs) but uh (laughs) it's worth it it's worth it to keep asking and i would Mm -hmm. even put on people who i had in my mind for a couple months down the road they were maybe a bit too green because i was like well i want to put them on stage now because i'm going to give them the experience of a chance to get better and in like a welcoming environment and that's our job it's the it's the same argument that i always have with like exclusivity in clubs Mm. not just from a a, a women's performance mm. like anything is like if you work this club you can't work these ones and I'm like well then how do I get better mm-hmm. so I can do your clubs more better mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. and it's like the same thing like I will look at my lineup for write them up and go not enough women gotta mm-hmm. gotta move it around you know I don't have I, you know when was the last time I had um, a black or Asian uh, comic on so these are the things I always have in my mind where mm-hmm. I'm just like you know I want to create as diverse a uh a show as I can because it needs to be reflective of the world 
And to your point, when I am out myself at open mics, as soon as I see someone that's 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 good, male or female, mm-hmm. but like certainly if a female, I go like, I want yeah. you on my show. Uh, I want you on my podcast. Totally. And it's it's to be able to provide that promotion. Mm-hmm. And because the the performers are not a 50 50 split yeah i think it's, it's not also, reflective yeah i think um something that a lot i hear a lot of bookers say is like there's just exactly that like there's just it, it, it's um the community is skewed i certainly like a lot of my friends that i see at open mics that i'm just like running mics and grinding it out whatever are a lot of dudes i know a lot of white mm. dudes to be very honest however I think it's our jobs, if we're saying, like, the women are at a disadvantage in these environments, or they can be, Mm -hmm. how do we proactively help this? So I think proactivity comes from creating a show where women will want to be on it. Like, what does it mean to not book people Mm -hmm. who are a problem in the community? What does it mean to advertise, or or when you're booking people, be like, hey, this is what I'm looking for? What does it mean to have your personal politics, you know, be open and and, uh, reflective of what you're trying to put on on your show? That's, I think, how you get that uh, consistency, because, you know, I even see it... I teach improv workshops and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. And there's so many people who I used to be of the mind, like um, there's not many people of color. This is especially in Montreal who are participating in the improv community. How can we change that? How can we make Mm -hmm. the environment more welcoming? In my mind, I'm like, well, we need people of color who are higher up to like help bring these people up. When the reality is there's not even the opportunity for them to get to that point because at the ground floor, there's so much, it's so inaccessible. Mm -hmm. So why would they stick around for five levels to try and, you know, start their own workshop or practice team? Why would they do that? It's not good for them. So what does it mean to, you know, change that culture? And I see, I see places like Second City that are really taking this bull by the horns Mm. and trying to, like, they're creating, like, female only, uh, Stand up uh, classes. Mm-hmm. They're doing like uh, b- bringing as much diversity as they can to all levels of the the comedy that mm-hmm. they teach and that sort of thing. And that's only going to pay dividends for them later. Because like again, like when I'm when I'm doing up my show, it's like it, you, you're stupid if you just make it all guys. Because what what draw? You're just going to get guys, mm-hmm. right? And women, they're being dragged there by guys. Mm-hmm. So if you enjoy. Uh, just having good comedy as a bottom yeah. line regardless, then more people are going to show up yeah. across the spectrum. Well, and it's yeah. only going to pr- pr- improve your show. Totally. I mean, I'm of the mind, like, I've never... My sh- a lot of the shows that I do are marketed as like LGBTQ positive mm-hmm. or feminist shows, and if people want to do content based around those things, that's awesome, and sure. totally, if they have bits, they should do them. But it's more just about being funny, and I feel like mm-hmm. it's more... It's literally like the best comedians I know already, without even maybe thinking about it, fall into those categories. Right. Because they don't need to rely on tired stereotypes. They're just... They're writing new jokes right. based on new things mm-hmm. um, that I haven't heard before, and new perspectives, new situations, and audiences super respond to it. Like, right. especially when I... You know, having come up in Montreal, it's a real student city, and I'm uh-huh. only 23. I was right. just recently in university, and a heavy politicized group of friends, and mm-hmm. in, in different... Uh, uh, activist groups and those people are some of the funniest most warm welcome open sweet people i know yeah. they want to go to comedy shows they just don't want to go to some like dusty basement where a man's gonna be like my girlfriend's a bitch because she has a ponytail you right. know like but they want to see comedy and they have mm-hmm. money they want right. to go pay to see this stuff so it's like you know why aren't we why aren't we do one right. taking their money yeah yeah yeah, yeah, two, yeah giving them this opportunity to see good I, comedy i am of two minds of this and i know i'm just trying to push it faster than it than it should go mm-hmm. is that I love seeing shows that say, like, we're LGBTQ friendly, Mm -hmm. you know, we are uh, women friendly, that sort of thing. Love seeing that. I hate that we have to say Oh, 100%. I hate that that has to be a thing that is driven out as opposed to just saying, can can we not just have a show and everyone be cool? Mm -hmm. Oh, 100%. I mean, my hope is, like, one day we don't need to have that and we don't need to have women's only festivals unless it's Mm -hmm. to showcase, like, you know, these women are all absolutely amazing at, like, this type of comedy, so we want to show them off, that kind of thing. Like... I hope that we don't have to do that. However, right. there are so many people like I'm a queer person and there's so uh, like, you know, previous partners of mine are like, I've never gone to a stand up show because I've seen stand up specials where I'm just like, I would send the audience feeling uncomfortable. Right. Um, and so for them to know that a show was specifically curated with that in mind is so valuable. Right. Um, and they won't go otherwise. So, those are my people. Like, I'm not making mm-hmm. comedy for dudes. Great if dudes love it. Right. I have a lot of dude friends. <laughs> Listen, mm-hmm. my friends are dudes. I I, mean, I like dudes. <laughs> I just, <laughs> but, you uh, just pulled the uh, tropes. Up. I got plenty of black friends. Yeah, I'm okay. Exactly. I got I can, plenty I, of dude friends. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and they're great. And there's a lot of great dude comedians. But there's there's enough that have kind of like 
isolated um, parts of my identity and you know other oppressed identities from sure. comedy and the comedy communities and um, it is important and it is mm-hmm. super weighty and there is a, a huge impact it isn't just you do seven minutes and you said like a dumb thing that you wrote because you thought it would be funny but it's really really racist and oh well I'm just not going to do that bit anymore like when you do that bit right you are alienating members right. of the audience. So yeah. I do believe that people should have an opportunity to try things out and whatever. Mm-hmm. But I also think, you know, Google is fucking free and you can yeah. Google stuff and educate yourself to mm-hmm. an extent that you shouldn't go up and alienate right. a huge amount of people in your audience. The <laughs> like, like if you, if you want, like I know, cause I've been, I've been doing this a while mm-hmm. that when a joke doesn't land, I go, Oh, it's not them. That joke yeah, ain't yeah, yeah. ready. Oh my god, how funny is it when green comics are like, "Oh, we're not a racism joke crowd." Right. Are we? You're like, like, "Shut up, you so dummy, bad. you dummy." Yeah, there's so many people who do that too. Uh-huh. It's very funny, and it's like I have I've always equated um, comedy to fugu. You know I have fugu no is? idea what fugu, fugu is. Fugu is blowfish sushi. And chefs go okay. to and chefs go to school for years to learn how to make it because if you cut it perfectly, right, it's I saw delicious. The episode, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I thought it was made up. I thought that was made up. It was like Homer to bring me fugu me, yeah. and he does that. I thought it was made up that the Simpsons just did it, but it's an actual thing, mm-hmm. and they go to school for years for it. And like, if you cut it right, it's delicious. If you don't, you die. Yeah. That's comedy. Oh, totally. Yeah. I don't think like people should never talk about race or never talk about rape. I just think if you're like a 16 year old dude at your first open mic, maybe you don't open with like material about people right. who are black because you think it it's going to get a rise out of people. You know, right. like uh, like Best Selling does amazing jokes about sexual assault. Mm-hmm. They're fantastic. Yes. She happens to have been a survivor of sexual assault, mm-hmm. so that definitely changes your perspective. Yep. However, like you know, I have a joke about consent and mm-hmm. like. I, I like I don't think I don't believe in like censorship like people shouldn't be able to talk about certain things and don't you ever dare but it's like think of the perspective you're coming at it with people think they're edgy by making these comments when in reality like you know society is already oppressive if you're making right. comments in that direction you're you're entirely mm-hmm. with the grain right you're not edgy at all yes you know? so. like the the jokes that I have that I'm currently working on because of the political climate mm. that we're in uh, I have a uh, racism joke. I have a joke about uh, Planned Parenthood and abortion in the states, mm. and the take is not that these should happen. Uh, certainly, mm. I my you know the, the take is the good side of history, and mm-hmm. so that's when you have that as a starting point, as opposed to going, oh, I'm going to be satirical about this. No, 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 no. Mm-hmm. Tell the truth first, like you say, mm-hmm. and like that's how I go at it. Yeah, and say like. This is stupid, right? Mm-hmm. And here's why specifically I think this is stupid. Yeah. I think it's even wild that we like, we're still, these topics are still such hot button topics when like there's literally, you can talk about anything in the, on this planet. I believe mm-hmm. that pretty much every joke is political just yeah. by the way that it interacts with your identity. Knock, knock. Um, that's offensive. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a door. Listen, anyone who's listening to this who isn't into, uh, you know, uh, anti-oppressive politics is pretty much right. thinking that's what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah that's yeah. awesome. But I, you know, like, you can, like, you know, I love, uh, he's being interviewed in another room right now, but I love Andy Kindler to pieces. He's one of my right. like, top three favorite yep. comedians. And, you know, he's not, I mean, he does do, uh, he, he has very specific political views. Mm-hmm. He does comedi- comedy about that, but also comedy not about right. that. If you don't know him, you should check him out. He's amazing. Yes. Um, he's coming up next. Is he really? He is. <gasps> I'm jealous. He is. He has been on the show before, so it's going to be nice to to reconnect with him. I saw the show last night. Yes, and, the show uh, was amazing. Scoville, best, fantastic. Friend, I worked with Rory Scoville in um, uh, Grand Prairie, Alberta. Really? And wow. we drove up there. I was opening for him, and uh, it was the first time we met. So, what a better way to solidify a friendship than five and a half hours each way in a car? <laughs> And so uh, we go up there and I do my opening while people are eating steak and really don't care for me. And so I get down, I have my dinner and I'm watching Rory and he's he's doing this show two weeks before he's about to do Conan. Mm. Uh, and I'm watching him for the first time ever. And like we've just spent five hours in a mm. car just kind of shooting the shit. And then I see him perform I know and I'm bad. like, I look at the crowd who are confused yeah and i just go you have no idea what you're witnessing <laughs> you have no idea you it's know it's wild uh when you see those perf- like people like that performing in front of kind of an average crowd or right. eating steak maybe not particularly expecting a comedy show and you're like you don't understand the art of what we yes, do exactly <laughs> exactly and the, and the, the thing uh-huh. is and and and, and to getting back to that 16 year old who thinks he can mm-hmm. do a rape joke there's a reason that uh people can do 
that material later on. Oh, yeah. because, and, and when when people would watch someone like Rory go, you call that art? And go, for him to just to do that takeaway that he did where he just shuffled off, like shuffled off what yeah, he just yeah. said, that takes timing, precision, and practice oh, and yeah. practice to be able to do it. So yeah, the the art of repetition and ownership of failure and embracing success, mm. uh, success that's what drives the art out of this. Oh, totally. You yeah. Know? Oh, 100%. I think uh, I was talking to Sarah Hennessy about that stuff on my podcast. Oh, yes. It's called Experts. We interview women and women identifying people mm-hmm. about things they're experts in. So they sometimes talk about how it intersects I with I look gender, forward to being on it. But not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, I've had some dudes see me post it and be mm-hmm. like, how about you come on my podcast? I go on yours. I'm like, did you even fucking right. read the no. thing? Did yeah, you even yeah, yeah. click the link? Right. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it does. That's why I'm talking about it. Uh, is... Uh, 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 yeah, they talk about things that they're experts in because I think I mean I love talking about this stuff, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of women. Who, people are like, so people still say women aren't funny, right? What's your comment on that? And they're like, I do so much important shit. Why do we have to have the same question mm-hmm. that's in like published in fucking right. you know every magazine every other month? Oh my god, I forgot to ask. What's it like being a woman <laughs> in comedy? <laughs> first yeah. suicide on uh-huh. audio? Oh, not the first. Oh no, no. Well, <laughs> you should listen to I'm season three. <laughs> you should listen to season three of this. It was uh, my questions were really poor oh that's okay yeah it happens you Mm -hmm. take a dip that's right i think um yeah the i mean so focusing on on uh uh, um talking about the art of doing stuff on stage and whatever talking to sarah hennessy about that stuff Mm -hmm. i find her persona on stage is amazing i think she's so fuck she's just a funny Mm -hmm. person and she has uh, one of the best episodes with her just because she's super fun to talk to and something that i'm kind of coming around to is so i have an improv and a stand-up background I do. I love improv. I feel like an, I'm an improviser at mm-hmm. heart. But when I do stand up, it's very specifically written, like all the beats, all the breaths, right. all the intonations. And I'm trying to. My goal right now is to find that happy medium. Mm-hmm. The more I have fun, the more I kind of fuck around, and right. the better it is. But there's still something in my head because I uh, was brought up around such kind of like old school comedy coming mm-hmm. up that I'm like, it has to be this way. And I right. think that's a problem for a lot of um, people who are not like the same identity as like you know Mm -hmm. our our classics that we look to of people who are really good joke writers because in my mind i'm like that's not really how my brain works the way that those jokes are written that's not really what i can do Mm -hmm. but i am funny and i can do this thing so that's kind of what my focus has been i don't know that was really general i think well but but it yet but yet there is some specificity to it because we are in a time now like you Mm -hmm. know where, where the classics when you look at like 80s evening at the improv where mm. it was just like oh look another guy in a rolled up sports jacket you know what's the deal with Very um cool. now comedy has become almost fetishized mm. to the point where i can find specifically what it is i like if i like storytellers mm-hmm. i can find storytellers if i like you know set up punch set up punch i can find that if i uh want to see bet style comedy i can do that if i want to see uh i was um uh uh talking with uh kevin messia uh about this and like he does a roadshow with like three other comics that i know that are filipino it's like mm-hmm. the filipinos of comedy mm-hmm. so you can find the things that you want to do not just on subject matter on the uh the type of comic that it is the type mm-hmm. of material is like you can find all of that mm-hmm. now and so that's what i think opens the door to great art like there's so much choice out yeah. there i feel like well, i mean also it's like a, it's a way to package this thing to sell it Mm-hmm. JFL baby you know yeah, it's like exactly. getting like you know who does the fam jokes about their parents who does right. jokes about race who does mm-hmm. jokes about being a mom who does jokes right. about being a dad uh, which I think is like I mean that's really like uh, simplifying it I think mm-hmm. you can find what you want but I find my interest is like I really love like Kate Berlant and John Early mm-hmm. um, like more people who are just like like I wouldn't even I think that's who people call like alternative comedy but to me right. it's just alternative to what alternative yeah. to like club comedy I yeah. guess sure. but I I don't think it's, it's not like they're like, I'm the kooky zany man. You right. Know? Yeah, like, yeah, they're yeah. still doing just really right. well written material and delivering it with these cadences. Right. Like, I suppose, you know, Emo Phillips is considered an alternative comedian because, mm-hmm. you know, his, his, um, cadence and his, mm-hmm. you know, everything. Um, but to me, it just isn't. I, I don't think I think alternative is this category that's kind of dis- the borders are dissolving and it's now like look right. at something like comedy bang bang or the popularization mm-hmm. of like the UCB theater and improv for humans right. like these are just comedians who are good and maybe not 
the center of you know um, conventional media, mm-hmm. and that's why they're seen as alternative. But they're right. really there's a lot more people who are like them than not. Well, Andy Kindler called it out last night at the mm-hmm. at the alternative show. Mm-hmm. He goes, "This is the most ludicrous <laughs> name because because hey, you're right. There is no there's no such thing anymore. Mm-hmm. Like there's." I don't think the comedy is alternative. I think the audiences are looking for an alternative. Mm. So I think like if you see, like I think you can go into like a demographic and know like what the type of club is. Like if you go into a ska club, Mm -hmm. you know there's going to be ska music. Like I think, I think that the types of clubs now have sort of like, or the types of venues that you go to or the types of shows that are being curated, that's what's driving the theme of the comedy. Mm -hmm. And then you can tailor your comedy that way i can work at a club like absolute i can also right. work at comedy bar in front of like a audience i know is going to be permissive of challenge mm-hmm. and will allow me to fail and try something and will applaud that whereas if i'm at absolute they'll do it to an extent but it's right. like you gotta be on less this. flexibility yeah exactly and if i'm doing like comedy in Essen, montreal mm-hmm. same sort of story is yeah, like, yeah that's interesting because i i don't really so i don't i don't uh play comedy works anymore but i play the nest a little bit and, right um the there definitely is a difference in the audience there between the independent shows i would say i don't i play independent shows far more than i play clubs right um but it's interesting I have been surprised more recently by the audiences I've been getting at the clubs, especially on week nights, not mm-hmm. on weekends. Right, have been pretty progressive audiences. Yeah. I, have, I do. I mean, so does me, and everyone's mother does a joke about Trump. But I do mm-hmm. like some jokes about Trump, and I've had weekend audiences at clubs be like, "Yeah, Trump, woo," and me being like, "Wow, no," you know, and having to. It becomes about that after. Afterwards. Sure. Um, actually, I brought that up with Brian Posey, and he was like, "Yeah, I don't let it." He, he's like, "I just shut that shit down." Right, 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 right. Them. I was like, right. "That's because you're you the best." You may leave. Yeah, exactly. Um, but those, I really find. I think if I can, I'm started seven sentences at once. <laughs> I used to think when I did shows that were like marketed as all female or female identifying lineups mm-hmm. or like all queer lineups that when the audience came and they were laughing at all my jokes, I'm like, this feels like cheating because it feels right. like they're going to be so warm. But then I re- realized like your average, like let's say weekend club audience, mm-hmm. that's how every dude feels going up because he doesn't have those controversial feelings because he hasn't had those experiences. Right. He's going to connect with these people so much easier. Right. So why do I feel like it's cheating? These are my people. These are people right. who I do comedy yeah, for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which I think is funny. Uh, cause I still think, you know, I've talked to dude comics about it before where they're like, yeah, well, like you could say like, I'm a woman in front of a group of women and they'll like clap for you. I'm like, think of how, how little you've gotten to engage with comedy that just being recognized for who you are right, is right, enough right. to get you excited. Uh-huh. And then we're going to go from there. Yeah. Okay. But to be fair, mm. I have friends of mine that are from the East Coast and the second that they mentioned that they're from Halifax, half the crowd erupts and then they're, <laughs> and then they're drinking fucking that's shots a, of tequila oh, totally. afterwards. That's been a so, whole, that's been a thing since the dawn of time. Right. Yeah. Like, uh, so don't throw that, you know, <laughs> I can't segment an audience bullshit Who at me. It? Like, um, Mike Kaplan had a yeah. bit about that. He was at Just for Laughs this past mm-hmm. festival in Montreal and he had a bit where he does a joke and then he breaks down the different parts of the joke that people woo at. And right. he's like, sometimes they say I was at this bar Moe's in Houston. People woo at the Houston. That's right. a tale as old as time. You take it where you can get it. Right. If I'm, if I'm here and I go, I'm originally from Toronto, and people right. are like, woo. I'm like, nice. yes. <laughs> yes, if I can just get one toe hold. Yeah. If I can just like find the Someone keystone I can grip on. Drink. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, that's all I want afterwards. <laughs> just buy me shots. That's it. Um, well, it's a pleasure to have you in the city now. Thank you. Because so, like, uh, like the Montreal scene, obviously, it's, it's very festival heavy. Yes. With a couple of clubs. There's more clubs kind of popping up here in Toronto, mm-hmm. which is which is a, a delight to see. And again, each one of them kind of carries their own style of audience and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. Um, where do you f- like where do you feel most comfortable? It's a good question. I, I really like since I moved here like six, seven days of days ago from this literal <laughs> I mean, day. You haven't got it. your research done. Come on. <laughs> I, d- I came Pick back up for a, a now. <laughs> I came back for a week of shows in uh, February and right. um I mean it's it's a generic answer but it's just cuz I don't have a more specific one sure. yet. And also it's true. Uh comedy bar is wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really really wonderful. I mean I do improv too and um there's a lot of like improvs that hang around there mm-hmm. and a lot of my friends who I whose comedy I really like perform quite frequently right. there. 
Also, um, I really like, and I, I wonder if they'll think it's weird that I even am mentioning this, but I really like the Ossington, mm-hmm. the book shows on No, it's on a fantastic, I'm, I'm doing that in a couple of weeks. Yeah, actually. it's, yeah. it's great. And I love, you know, like Tim Blair mm-hmm. and, uh, um, uh, Michael, Mike, Michael Kohlberg and Nick Nimeroff mm-hmm. and, and, uh, and Maria Stoyek, like are all people who are just very wonderful and very good comedians and who I like to watch. So right. I know if they run a show, it's going to be fun. And Selby Nixon, I think, is involved with mm-hmm. that. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, I'm going to be doing Hard Day Comedy run by Lexa Graham soon. Okay. And I think she's fantastic. Mm-hmm. So anything involved with her? Really, I, it's more comedians in the shows they put on. I really like Chantal Morastica. So right. their show is really, I'm sure, is going to be amazing. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I'm just. This is. I turn this into me plugging comedians that I like. I think this is not what you wanted me to <laughs> no, do. No, but no, no. That anyway. is. So, so trust me. There have been like, like I have been very fortunate. Um, uh, you never know when you're going to get someone in the junket, mm-hmm. right? So uh, there's always like lists of questions. I have that. That's one of the questions okay, that I cool. always love to ask. Is like, who are you liking in yeah. this scene? You know. Well, I can give my Montreal ones because you haven't ever had a Montreal scoop. Ooh. I don't think. Um, Aloha ha in okay. Montreal. There's okay. a, there's a secret venue called Psychic City. They have a Facebook okay. page and they do a bunch of amazing events. One called Aloha ha, which is just a book stand up show. Really good. Okay. Um, Trana Vision, which is run by Trana and Tour, a very mm-hmm. good friend of mine, an amazing Montreal comedian. Mm-hmm. Actually, I think comes to Toronto every once in a while. Okay. Um, she f- screens a film and has a panel of comedians that do live commentary and it's so much fun. So it's like MST3K uh, for a film. Exactly. For a non specifically scientific film. Yeah. Or uh, sci- uh, sci fi film. I wanted to say, I tried to say, Yes, so many times during that, but I have no idea what the references that she made. I'm going to be straight up with you. MST3K? Yeah. Mystery Science Theater 3000. Oh, yes. yeah. Okay, I've heard of that, but I've never seen it. Okay. Um, but they did a revival of that, did they not? Are they- yes, they did. Okay, they did. it's on I Netflix. Think, uh, yeah, and Jonah Ray, I think, is, so yes, is I, on yeah, Okay, yeah. I do know what you're talking yes. about. Um, many yeah, people they do. have to go through this journey with me. <laughs> That's okay. You are I not thought, alone. I mean, I thought a more applicable one would be like Video on Trial, but you went straight for the cool I went for, underground reference. I went for the oldie nerdy I one. I it. I love it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, Trend Vision is great. And, I mean, I could plug my own show. I used to do a show that's, like, going to come back infrequently mm-hmm. called Joke Town, where over the course of four days, 10 to 12 comedians that are mixes of uh, stand-up sketch improvs, like comedy actors, right. clowns, whatever, mm-hmm. um, write 10 to 12-minute short comedy plays based on a series of themes that have no accordance with each other. Right. So it always ends up being just fucking bananas Mm -hmm. it's also a written satirical uh uh newspaper well not satire because told you didn't like that but like nonsense (laughs) newspaper um uh off of that uh that we made with some of the senior editors at drawn and quarterly uh which is really cool it's not a drawn and quarterly product but it they are very talented in any case those are the rooms that i like in montreal i also i used to work i was the associate artistic director at montreal improv theater Mm -hmm. um and a lot of their shows are great. The Super Bon Bon, uh, Easy Action, Color Outside the Lines, the, uh, Twins, mm-hmm. which is where we pair a teacher up with a, co- a rising student. Right. Are all these really fantastic mm-hmm. shows. You had me at Super Bon Bon. Super Bon Bon. The Super Bon Bon is the name of the show of like the group of players at the theater with, I think, you know, like just the most mm-hmm. impressive credits basically right. playing together. Um, is named by James McGee, who's the artistic mm-hmm. director. Right. He loves... He loves naming shows and he's right. very good at it. Uh, I can only imagine he also loves soul coughing. <laughs> yeah, it's the name of a. Uh, is it not? Wait, it's, you tell me what the that is. is. It's it's uh, one of the lyrics from one of their songs. Yes, he does that right. quite frequently. Uh, right. Where he'll take a song lyric or a name of a song mm-hmm. or an old band. Right. He likes to. He I think he called a. He's a suggestion he gave for a scene was rat fucker, which is beautiful. Yeah. I have no idea where that reference is from. It's a band name. Okay. Wow. You know what? We've referenced each other to the point of oblivion where neither of us know what we're talking about no. anymore. <laughs> exactly. Um, so do you have any more shows left in the fest? I do. Tonight I'm on Cloud Comedy okay. at 930 Beauty. at Bad Dog. And that's mm-hmm. um, like Chris Locke's on that, Mark Little, yep. mm-hmm. Kirsten Rasmussen, Sarah Hennessy. Like it's going to... I'm, yeah. I'm plugging other people because it's a wild lineup mm-hmm. and I'm very excited to right. be on it. Um, Sketch Troop Tony Ho as well. And um, I'm also doing uh, the solo, solo character showcase 8 p.m. at Comedy Bar in the Cabaret on Saturday, the okay. last night of the festival. I think if I have all my ducks in a row with a producer, we may get this out in time for the show tonight. Woo-hoo. If not, I hope you enjoyed your, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed your trip in the car with the flux capacitor so you could go back and see it after you're done <laughs> killing Trump and Hitler. Obviously, those are your first stops. Mm-hmm. Trump, uh, Trump versus Hitler. Stop first. in, have a snack, and then uh, come in and see that show. But Love definitely, it. it definitely will be up by Sunday. So you, they, oh, they, amazing. Can, they can go and see that. Thank um, you so much. So now you're here in Toronto. 
mm-hmm. um, next season or the season after. I'm, we'll, we'll get you on for like an actual episode. Okay. Where you're not just like running in going, hi, I moved and this is a thing and <laughs> blah, blah, go see Montreal Comedy. It's great. Um, yeah, so we can it actually sit down like and have like a like... non-rush conversation and mm-hmm. I will turn on the recorder in an appropriate time. <laughs> that could be like something. It. Novel. Uh, and we supply coffee and tea or anything harder that you wish to drink. Whoa. So, yeah. yeah. I don't know how you run your little podcast over there, but beverages are given. We do tea and okay. then once we did Cinnamon Hearts but stuff totally Love started eating them during the podcast. Oh no, no! You got to keep her away <laughs> like, from that uh, shit. She was like, "I don't know why I just started eating these." It was right. very funny. If you Good if act. you had said the guest had had started eating some in hearts, my first guest would have been Steph Tolos. <laughs> that's my hilarious, first. wonderful, based uh-huh. in LA. That's a right. Tear, a tear yes, for her. Um, th- that's the other thing I loved. Uh, not to drag this out no, further, please. but like when I listen to the Jackie and Lori show, mm-hmm. which is Jackie Cation and Lori Kilmartin, mm-hmm. uh, which is a similar kind of format to you, is like it's, except it's just them every week talking about um, comedy as it pertains to them mm-hmm. as well as they highlight a, a comic of the week, which is a woman in comedy that they want you to do. And I'll just hear them say, oh yeah, I was hanging out with Debbie Giovanni the other day. Or like uh, Christine Waukesha mm-hmm. uh, will be loving this line and blah, blah, blah. It's like, I love when I hear people that I know. I know. That are in circles of people that I appreciate. Yeah. And I just like, only good things can happen. It was way. funny when you said that you said Debbie Giovanni because... When uh, I was doing that podcast, with, uh, Kyle Kinane was like, "Oh, Deb Giovanni is great. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. She's crushing. She's like, he's like, she's the best comic in LA right now. Like, right. He, she, he was like singing your praises. Right. Um. So that's just like a cool. Mm-hmm. It's so cool. I mean, and she is amazing. She deserves that of spotlight. Of course. Um. But yeah, it's always a little like, ah, I remember yeah. when, you know, uh-huh. I barely know. I'm not trying to imply that we're close friends or anything. But right, right, I saw right. her perform and she was on my podcast right. and stuff like that. So. The, like, it, it was when I, I knew the type of person that she was like, I always knew she was great. Like, you know, mm-hmm. we, she and I have done rooms together and like, you know, we're not in the same squash ladder, but we definitely know each other. So mm-hmm. it was like, hi, how are you? Like, we'll see each other. And when she got last comic standing and the word rifled around the mm-hmm. Toronto community, um, there is not one person I know of that didn't react with, of course, mm-hmm. finally, like good for her, like nothing but the best. There was no bitterness. That's like, and that tells you the character of someone who's like work you appreciate, the person you appreciate. Like it's it's lovely when those things dovetail, totally. you know, because there's enough comics out there with like one or the other, mm-hmm. and uh, you oh, just yeah. go, Ugh. yeah. It's yeah. good when it's good when we get a win, you know. Yeah, it's Supported. nice, right? There's an honor among thieves. Mm-hmm. Yes, amen. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you for having me. This was a blast. Um, there you go. Uh, I think you're no stranger to a microphone. Certainly a tinny one. I hope so. Certainly a tinny one. Last night, yes, right? Yes, yes. Uh, the tinny one. The tinny one. The So the last time you were here, you actually came to my house because that's where the studio is. Oh, that's is when right. you're at a comedy bar. Yes. And, yeah. And yes, so, that was fun. And we hung out there. This will be a chore. I'll make sure of it. Um... Uh, good to have you back. Good to have you back. Um, I mean, good to have me back. It's a, ple- it's I mean, a pleasure to be, to be in, in our company. That's it's right. A, yes. We're, yeah. we're together again. Uh-huh. Uh, we Who were, else was there when I was at your house? Uh, I think uh, I think Gary Rideout came with, uh-huh. and uh, Ian Atlas, maybe. And did you have a, you had somebody else on the show with you, right? No? No, it was just oh, you. Oh, wow. It was just you. There was an entourage. I no, I thought you had like a, uh, someone you were bantering oh, Dar- with. Oh, uh, Darcy. That yes. would have been the producer who is going to be scrambling to put this thing out on time. So, uh, uh, Well, especially yeah. with all the funny I provide. Exactly. What do you, what do you leave out? <laughs> what do you put in? I don't know uh-huh. what I'm saying. That's exactly. right. We can do drops afterwards if you want. Uh, is that, what does a drop mean? It's like where you record something afterwards and then you put it in. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I'm Eddie Kindler and you're, uh, you're a living. That's right. <laughs> now, those are called IDs. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, uh, when did IDs become pull quotes? Because that's something. Oh. Right? I like now, that. Because now everyone is just going, oh, that's a pull quote. And so it, oh, yeah. Just, aren't you just telling me about the thing that's the thing? Yeah. yeah. Uh, a pull quote is, I, lo- I need more pull quotes. Yeah. Or I need to, I need one of two things. More pull quotes or I need to eliminate all the negative stuff about me that's mm-hmm. out there. Okay. One of the two would be <laughs> one good. Of the two. There's a vacuum. One of my favorite pull quotes uh, is actually from Jimmy Pardo. I have it on my website. Not my cup of tea. <laughs> I well, love it. I actually have a joke okay. about Will and Grace. Not only is Will, Will and Grace not my cup of tea, right. it makes me hate tea. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's nice. I did like it. Yeah. Nice bit of, it's a Are nice you looking bit of forward to the return of Will and Grace? Um, so I wasn't because I, I. I, I never watch it. But I then never they watched said, it. But now they said, oh, they're going to they're gonna take on the Trump era. This is the Trump oh, era Will God. and Grace. And I'm like, oh, two things I hate at once. Yeah, right. who who wants to be reminded of that hideous right. man? I there was a time there, like between that and Dharma and Greg. As soon as yes. the sh- as soon as the show had an ampersand, I paid no attention to it. Uh, oh, was it an ampersand? In, I think in it was. Oh. I think it was Will and Grace, and like, or, or just the word "and." And Any- hope and Gloria. Uh huh. I used to have a uh, a joke about how they got like a show, Hope and Gloria. How the you know what are the odds of them coming up with that? A hundred percent since they wrote it. So it's like right. up and dawn. Pro yeah, yeah. and Connie mm-hmm. tonight and tomorrow. <laughs> um, up and Dawn should be a up show. and Dawn should be good. That should be good. Pro and Connie. Mm-hmm. That's right. Um, I was actually just uh, uh, talking with uh, DJ about this, um, where we were talking about the concept of, of alternative comedy. And yes. you, you called it out while you were doing your own intro last night, which was fantastic. I don't remember and what I did. You uh, did. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be oh, about the name of the said. show. The name of the show. Uh, the most anachronistic. anachronistic. Yeah, sure. Uh, and by the way, thank you for finally getting anachronistic right. That was what a, do people normally say? Well, no, you just said it right. Oh, okay. You said it right. Well, it, was it, good. it sounds like it's 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 a ripe for a malapropism. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because I was saying that and I got the sh- when I started the show. Uh, we needed an alternative comedy show. Right. It was at Montreal, mm-hmm. and comedy was during that the boom period. Then it right. imploded from the boom period, mm-hmm. and so I tried to come up with other names, and I did come up with other names that were bad. The Comedy right. Lab, right? I remember that one. That's right. Uh, then, the, but uh, you know, Mulligatawny jokes, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and then Bruce Hills, to his credit, said, "Just name it the alternative show, and right. let's let's, let's uh, lock mm-hmm. it down." Right. <laughs> and that's – so the, the the consensus we sort of came up with was that it's not – like the comedy itself is not alternative because you can do virtually the same material yeah. in front of different audiences. It's the audiences that are looking for a, a potential alternative. Like it's like you look at a club and go, okay, the comedy magic sh- um, uh, theater is going to be different than Nerd Melt, which is going to be different than a uh, third – LA venue that I can't come up with. No, you're absolutely like, right. It does define the the crowd uh, more than it defines the the the, the type of comedy. Right. Or, but I used to when I when we when, when the, it was kind of started on both coasts, mm-hmm. New York and LA in the '90s. We kind of had an agreement that we would uh, work on new material, kind right. of. Right. Yeah, so that's yeah, yeah. why I, I hope people will work on new stuff when they mm-hmm. do the show. But it doesn't matter to me. I don't care what they do. Right. I think is. I think we're we're past the point where comedy needs to have a structure, That's because true. there's because there's so like there's we're so spoiled for choice right now, and I think I've said it like I don't know in like every p- person's interview that I've done like this is like there's so much different comedy out there you can find yes. what you want specifically. Well, one of the big yeah. uh, b- the big innovations. That's not an innovation, but back in the old days, you couldn't see. You know, they would say just come to the comedy club. They mm-hmm. they didn't want comics to feel like they were getting too big a name, so the clubs right. would want to say, "Oh, they're coming to the Funny Bone." Or whatever. Right. And yeah, yeah. but the the problem was that nobody knew what it'd be like going to a movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, what movies playing? I right. don't know. You like I don't movies? Know. A film. Yeah, but so now that people yeah. can even just see a clip of someone, mm-hmm. that's that right away makes the audiences twice as good. Yeah, and there's, I don't I don't know whether it's. Um, whether it's more education or whether we are where we are right now, I'm finding audiences like even in big kind of showcase rooms, not all of them, but a percentage are like, let's see if this guy can fail. Like, let's, oh, let's, give, them permission. let's give them permission to try something. Oh, I see. Yeah. You know well, what I, I mean? That's a cool thing. Like, like, are you finding that like the, like the more rooms that you're, you, that you're doing in your, in your scene go on or like, like what's your, what's your take? I on don't that? really, to me, it's a, uh, uh, I've been, you know, I've been doing stand up for over thirty years. So mm-hmm. to me, I don't even have a view of what it's like. Say if you're starting, or whatever. And I've always right. been in L.A. and mm-hmm. I've always loved L.A. But I moved to L.A. before I started comedy, so I never was like. It's always hard, I think, when you move to L.A. and you start measuring how long you've been there. Right. You know. So uh, I do think it's the best time period that's ever been for comedy right mm-hmm. now, and that could change if the world is incinerated by right. Trump. Right. Right. So. Let's, I don't mean to get anybody down. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you find, like, like you don't do an awful lot of political material. It's interesting that I, not interesting, yeah. but I don't, I would think I would do more. I do some. So it's, here's the thing. Um, there's not just, it's not just a stage anymore for comics either. 
because there's different avenues. You can do funny things for funny or die. You can do right. uh, just YouTube clips. You can do uh, Instagrams. You can do Twitter. Yeah. Uh, which I don't know if you know this, Andy. You have a Twitter account. I do. You do. I do. I have a, problems on Twitter, but I'm getting better. That's can right. I, can you tell I'm getting better? Um, I think, if, if I may. Sure. The question is not what Ricky Gervais. The question is why Ricky Gervais. No, no. It's yeah. it's more like why why the obsession kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. We so all people, have that. Well, people say that the, it's not that I'm obsessed. It wasn't that I was obsessed with him. Right. It really had to do with how much I disliked him. Sure. And so he has a way of online. He is. He's a. I think he's a really a nasty person. Is mm-hmm. my opinion. And I used to love the original Office. Sure. I loved extras. Yeah. So he has a thing. Like, there's a guy who wrote a completely bogus article about me. Just a terrible article. Okay. Based on the fact that I blocked him on Twitter. He didn't okay. say that in the article. Right. So he starts. He wrote this article, and then Ricky Gervais uh, directs his thousands upon billions mm-hmm. of fans over. Right. So it's like he's. You know, it's like he knows what he's doing. I just got so annoyed that he kept saying he was ignoring me. He was never ignoring right, me. He right, would right. see every single. But right. no, I absolutely. I'm ignoring you. Isn't that right? At Andy Kindler. Well, no, he never would say at Andy Kindler. No, no. And, but also, he's, a, he's like an old school bully. Mm-hmm. And so that, there's a part of me that just hate, hates him. But I did. But, but all my friends were saying it's mm-hmm. getting too much. So, and right. that happens to me with Twitter about every couple uh-huh. of months. Right. I get too obsessed with it, and I have to learn to back mm-hmm. off of it. I had the same thing with Ann Coulter. And then post the election, I was like, I can't follow her anymore. I had she was we, my hate, she was my hate follow. And were you talk, did you uh, tweet her? Oh God! Every and did day. she tweet back? Oh no! Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, never would she. Never would she. I, like it got to the point that this is what I would do, and it's it's so juvenile. But I don't mind sharing with you, Andy. Uh, I would take like whatever she said, right, and just retweet it, like requote it. Yes. And I put in the word queef. Oh, okay. Right, because <laughs> that's the sound a mm, makes, and. Uh, it got to the point where I was doing this so often, I would get like likes and whatever. If I missed one, my followers would go, hey, Todd, you missed this one, queef. And they would do my work for me. Right. I was like, now it's gotten too big for me. Yeah. You know. You know. Let's bring it back down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and so I just, I, like, I knew after the election, I was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to, like, I will get zero work done. I'm just going to hate myself all day. This is it. Well, the thing you know. is, that's what started. That, that's what really started the Gervais thing. Is I would go to his Twitter page, right? And because, like, if I'm bored, I go, "What? What are these other people saying?" And I would mm-hmm. go to his thing, and he'd always be like, have these pictures of himself laughing hilariously, right? And it's just like, uh, just bragging about how big his crowds are. I just mm-hmm. to me, it's so odd, right? It's so anti comedy to mm-hmm. be just braggy. But now, but but you're right. It becomes an obsession, and right. But the not, and and not that he's here to defend himself. But like you know, if I could, you know, armchair, sure, uh, you know, you know, psychiatrist and therapist. He doesn't and stuff. Need to defend himself, right? Um, oh, he'll be scouring this one. What's Kindler saying about me now? <laughs> uh, you look at the office. You look at the character he played in the office, and it was like a very vulnerable yet brag braggadocious guy. Right. Right. Ditto extras. Like you saw. I like both those shows. Right. They're great shows because you you get the feeling they're a continuation of. And the joke was on him a lot. Yeah. He was exactly. So like when you're writing that and you recognize this is my foible and I can write to that and still make myself the butt of the joke, right? Uh, that's that's when you go. Okay, this is probably genuine. But you know, you get money or you get fame. And people say, oh, that guy turned to an asshole. He goes, no, he was always an asshole. He was always a jerk. It just, as as soon as you get one of those two things, it amplifies what your core person is. Well, also, right? I, I'm learning if there's some things about England. I mean, it's, of course, everything's in the, everything is a stereotype. Right. So I, I'm, but I used to be like overly the other way. Everybody from England was genius. Right. And so I'd be like almost too deferential. Mm-hmm. But um, there are a lot, of, there's a lot of cruel uh, like one of my heroes is John Lennon, and mm-hmm. John Lennon was all had a now, certain. What, what comedy troupe was he in? He was in the Mixed Nuts. Okay, uh, and John Lennon was known for being be cruel in his mm-hmm. comedy, but he was very very funny. Right, but there is a like a sometimes a more of an edge, and like what what Ricky Gervais does, he does a lot of fat shaming, mm-hmm. and it just drives me nuts. Right, because he's obviously got issues about his own body, mm-hmm. and he thinks because he's so mean to himself that it's okay for him. To right. uh, just be mean to other people, mm-hmm. so I just like I mean, it, it, it's like he, he, there's a cruelty to his stuff right. that bothers me, mm-hmm. but not the office. No, no. But even like even then, like he knew like that butt of that joke is like when he's uh, when he's going and doing like those corporate. Um, 
when he's doing the corporate uh, speaking event. Right, and right. He tanks afterwards, and so like you know, he's just taking his shirt off at the end. As soon as the woman walks in, and then like up goes the gut. Like it's an yeah. easy, it's an easy joke, but it's like oh, he's making that as a, at himself. Obviously, you get right, it. but when he just brags about how well he does, how much mm-hmm. money, like he'll have here's here's he'll be a Twitter exchange. Right, he'll, uh, someone will say something to him, and they go, "Oh, yeah, that that really bothers me. I guess mm-hmm. I'll go home to my mansion now." Right, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. Oh, he thinks that the fact that he has money, right, means something. Uh-huh. It, I mean, right. it means that you can. It's right. nice. I like that money yeah. too. Hey, it worked for Manunchin's wife. <laughs> have at it. Have at it. But this is so. Again, let, we can talk about Twitter and. Uh, like all day but like it just it, it becomes like there's two things that i that i like it for is like just the baseline information of like this is what's happening right now and that sort of thing but it's also like seeing people use it as a different form for comedy right and being able to craft a joke and uh like i think people like you i think people like like when you look at uh gilbert godfried yeah he's doing like his lame jokes i apologize to ants for that horrible horrible joke yeah you know no i love it i love it for that reason Mm -hmm. you know like mark maron's pointed out to me when you look back like six months later most of the stuff is gobbledygook for sure sure. of course it is (laughs) so that's why i I just have to as an ocd person Mm -hmm. spend less time on it right that's my big problem in life Mm -hmm. but that's been always since social networking started right it's like i i don't i it's just like Mm -hmm. between messages text messages Answering machine mm-hmm. message. We don't have an answering machine, right. but the phone message. Mm-hmm. It's like I can't keep up. Right. I wish. I mean, it sounds like I'm popular, but I'm just right. badly organized. Well, no. And then, like every eight months, there's like a new thing. Yes. So it's like, hey, are you on Bloober? No, I'm not on Bloober. What the hell's a Bloober? Right. Like, oh, it consolidates here. I like here. Bloober. Bloober? Yeah, because it'd be like bloopers. Yeah. I was I was thinking it'd be like like a blue Uber of some sort. I've then, started yeah. Juber. Okay. What's that? Yeah, it's just a Jewish person picks you up <laughs> and drives you places. Here's so. Let's let's continue on with like the sort of the Ricky Gervais thing, not him specifically. Sure. But one of the things that I that I uh, that I love about you and your and, and the show last night and your material in general is that you will graciously take the swipes of people that, in my opinion, need the swipes done. You can't make fun of Jimmy Fallon enough for my take. Right, and now right? I'm actually um, done with it. But, you know, to me, like, the Jimmy Fallon thing was a, was a, was a victory, right. in a way, because uh, w- when, when he... Ta- uh, uh, you know, Normalized Trump. Yeah, yeah. Then everybody was kind of, like, mm-hmm. on my side about it. But right. before that, I'd get people mad. Um, now, sometimes I feel bad for him, because mm-hmm. he seems to be... He seems to be struggling as a guy. He, he, he do- and... But here's the thing, and and I'm pretty sure you share this opinion as well. Um, my wife always was like, "Why do you hate Jimmy Fallon so much?" I do. I just do. I just do. She's like, "Okay." And so like we were in uh, bed one night, and it's like just winding down from the day. I'm reading the news on Twitter, and she's going through Facebook, and one of her friends liked this video of like Jimmy Fallon doing like a lip sync with yeah, you know exactly. you know Sir Ian McCallum or something like that, or and she watched it, and she just turned to me and went. You're right. He's not good. And I was like, <laughs> I've never loved you more, sweetheart. Well, you know, the thing that's interesting, well, it's not interesting. Never preface anything with this interesting, but he I'm did. He, yeah. he was like on, he did, the Saturday Night Live had a summer show, mm-hmm. and he did, uh, I forget, he did like an impression of a president, or I forget. Right. But he was very funny. Okay. You know, he, he can be funny. Yes. But the thing about him is that he should never have hosted a talk show. No. He's just not interested, and he's, everything is great. Mm-hmm. Great, 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 great. Right. Like, there's no critical analysis. There was like, like at least you knew where you stood with Letterman, right? And right. Letterman was was real. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, he had a real personality on TV. Right. And then the other thing is that uh, people sometimes I'll just the thing that's weird about Twitter is I'll just in the in the moment uh, get a feeling about somebody, so I'll say it. So like I'll say something negative about Eddie Izzard. He was just right. driving me nuts. Right. Then it gets into this whole thing where people are arguing and that this is mm-hmm. my problem again. Right. It's like I'm not it's, it's just my opinion in mm-hmm. that moment. Right. You know, and that's where I think Twitter sometimes is harder because mm-hmm. it's out there in print. You know, where you're screen capping it and go, this yeah. is what Andy Kindler said about, you know, Catherine Bach. And like, don't know why she's taking a swing at Daisy Duke, but OK, she obviously yeah. did something. Who is Catherine Bach? Catherine Bach was Daisy Duke on the original. Uh, oh, Dukes, Dukes of, of Hazard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. she was hot, right? I just out. I just out referenced you. That's pretty good. In the good. 80s. Come on. Well, you know, I come thought on. Daisy Duke. I thought the way you were saying it, it sounded like uh, D- Dagwood Blondie. Right. <laughs> <laughs> who also was attractive. Um, let's you mean it. like as a cartoon figure? Oh, yeah. Dagwood was definitely punching above his weight. No, no question about it. She was yeah. sexy. Yeah, very. Um, the, 
this again is like you know going back to your comedy is like between this and like the state of the industry address it, that you do at JFL you stand by your convictions and that's that's what I I absolutely adore about your stuff not to you know over congratulate you but it's worth it because you will and your Twitter example is is perfectly that where you just go this is my opinion right and it's interesting how many people there's there's when you're doing your save the industry address, there's usually two groups of people. There are the people who are immediately on board. Right. And the other people who are go, yeah, he's got a point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you there's know? also, this, this is like an unwritten rule. It's like a f- fake unwritten rule that you're not supposed to make fun of other comics. Right. But it just doesn't make any sense to me. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, it's a weird deal though, because sometimes if I'm, you know, it's like, I'm constantly trying to see if I'm, am I being cruel just to be cruel right. or, you but know, the, it, but that also goes to the sentiment, and this has always been there for comics, and I don't know why it is. It's like we can take swings at so many people, but the second someone takes one at you, it's like, how dare we you? We have very thin skin. Yeah. All Slap comics Slap of the do. glove, we'll see it dawn. Yeah. All, but all, and I think all comics do. Why is that? Uh, I think because we're all sensitive. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I think nobody can, everyone can dish it out, nobody can take it. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you, have you ever been on the receiving end of a burn where you just go, God damn it. Well, I actually, I mean, I like the roast element Mm -hmm. to comedy where you're roasting someone. Mm -hmm. So I like when someone gets on me like a friend of mine. Right. But if it's not friendly, then Mm -hmm. it can easily get into hurt feelings. Right. You know. And it's, but if you you look now at, at like the, like the roast shows are almost a channel on their own right now. Yeah. Right? Like uh, like Jeff Ross just does, you know, the roast of so and so, the rest of like like it just it seems and to Gerardo, going. And like when Gerardo God rest his soul, he was amazing at mm-hmm. it. You know, like some people really are good at it. I actually am not I, I've done roasts just for friends and things. Mm-hmm. It's actually nerve wracking to me. Right. It's harder for some reason. It's, well first of all it, it you I would only do it to the people that I really love. Because mm-hmm. then you can, because because you're into the you're you're into their things. You know their foibles, and you know how far you could take something. Right. Whereas if you don't know something, you go, I don't know how the fuck they're going to take this, and then you know you're you're uh, out on a raft right then. You don't know what. And that's going why on. the when they started to go into this thing where they roast anybody, it right. started to lose. I think the the idea of the old roast were that they all knew each other. Mm-hmm. Yes, and so it was definitely more collegial and mm-hmm. more family there was a there was a list of rules there was a or like unspoken rules where oh really where you'd where, I, I think it would just be because everyone knows each other right and yeah you go like like nothing would be above board like unless like you know someone was caught like you know you know uh you know banging uh banging the guy's wife and then suddenly he's like oh i'm gonna take you down here but like you yeah. never kind of saw that it's like and now it's just like I think the best example is like when Mark Maron was on, was it Chevy Chase's roast? Mark Maron and I were both on the same That's roast. Right. Yeah. I got cut out, though. Oh, is that right? Yes. Oh, geez. <laughs> but we were on the same day. How were your Chevy Chase jokes? They, it wasn't good because I went on. It was a uh, I, I, uh, I've made this joke before, but it was the only gig that I've ever been in danger of uh, that the gig was going to go into the second day because mm-hmm. it right. started like six at night with food. Right. And I went on at like 1115 mm-hmm. after Lisa Lampanelli. Right. And I, I can't follow Lisa Lampanelli. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, even into a, 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 a room. Mm-hmm. So it was really, really, uh, he, and he heard, and all the jokes have been done by, about right. him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was making notes for his own speech during mm-hmm. my thing and right. kind of ignoring me. Sure. And I kind of did bomb. Right. Uh, and a lot of people bomb, but, Mar- uh, you know, didn't bomb. Oh, Geraldo, I think that was his mm-hmm. first one. That's right. That's right. So. But, and, and again, it goes back to that thing of like, do you even know the guy? Like yes. that's like that's what hurts. Like you know, when you're just basing everything on hearsay and stuff like that. Like if it was if it was a roast thing, I would like I would want to know someone. I want to at least like take him to dinner first, right? So you can figure shit out. So there's got to be you... something going right. on, right? Or like when they did Trump. To me, that jumps the shark. Yeah. yeah. No, any, in, anybody who encouraged Trump before he right. won is deserves uh, in, scorn. In retrospect, we did not know what we were doing. True. Yeah. Um, especially, and I. I don't know. Do you go back to like that correspondence dinner where Obama was taking yeah, a lot of Trump? Do you go back to that and think that was the moment? It was. I think that did make him run. But the thing is, I just can't. It's just it's, it feels like a nightmare that has been unlike anything we've ever gone through because mm-hmm. Nixon was smart. Sure. I didn't like him. But no, he, but, but he, this guy, you literally the rules on the lid of the box. Yes. Right. He was familiar with things. Mm-hmm. This guy is not familiar. He's just like a, he just whatever he wants to say. Right. Now. 
obviously we're up here. We only get like, you know, secondhand information about it. What is it like now trying to write comedy in like a, a post Trump world now? I think it's good for comedy. I mean, I get very angry about it, Mm -hmm. uh, but it's bad for everything. So it will eventually be bad for comedy too, Uh because you just have the feeling that, you know, he's threatening North Korea. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, he doesn't live in South Korea. He doesn't live anywhere near it. No. So, but he doesn't, to be fair, he doesn't live near anything that he is supposedly for. I mean, uh, I was watching, it was a, it came up as like, um, uh, Bill Maher, uh, new rule or whatever it was where he basically took to, and you, you know, we all have our own opinions about Bill Maher, but the, but the thing that he mentioned was that, um, he basically equated Trump as the huckster, like the big city slicker huckster who found a new set of rubes <laughs> and well, that's for sure. And, and that's, that's how they got played. And that's what I was like, you know, he doesn't care for you people. Like there's no way he'd show up at your double wide and have Sunday dinner with you for a photo op. Right. You no, know, unless it's well done, steak covered in ketchup. Right? He, 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 yeah. And he right. cares nothing about anybody else mm-hmm. anyway. Right. And so like, and what, what I find is astound- think you like steak with ketchup. No, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> It's just I'm chewing my way through it's this. Just, he a, knows it hasn't been, you yeah. know, it's just is a creature of habit. What what I what I find really interesting though is that in in his election, all the all the GOP members kind of falling into lockstep behind That's him, sad. yeah, and not realizing that the water is at their necks right now with I everything hope you're right. that they're doing, right? Because like I think you're I think you're starting to see some turn down there, but like like are you? Like, uh, do, do you, does your activism go further from the stage? Like, 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 how how do you live? Oh your yeah, life these I mean, I'm, I have to be honest. Say I haven't been on uh, marches and stuff, right? Uh, but I would mm-hmm. go on marches, and I'm like, you know, that's all I can think about, basically. Right. And I think he will be impeached, but who mm-hmm. knows? It's just. I'm basically I'm mostly a positive person, so I'm not rooting for anything bad to happen. But I I, I just have a feeling he won't be in office that much longer. Right, but. The wonderful thing about this, and when I say wonderful, I mean horrible. Every time you think, ha ha, that's it. It's, yeah. it's whack Something worse. All over again. Like yeah. something, he just drops out of sight and pops up over yeah. here. Is like, and nothing seems to oh, stick I'm worried to that he'll get away with it because I don't trust the Republicans. I mean, the, the, Trump is as much a, a result of the Republicans as mm-hmm. he is um, uh, his, in other words, like they created him. Mm-hmm. By having so many wedge issues and right. by promoting racism, uh-huh. so they're so, not that much better than him. So with that, so with so with the bile that he's kind of pushing forward as an agenda, what what have you seen in comedy? Like like in, like L A is is really hot for comedy. Obviously, always always kind of has been since, yeah. you know, since the dawn of like the the late night talk shows, and that scene has always been there. It's always been strong, and it's a draw for a lot of my friends who have gone down there to L A to find work in comedy. What are you noticing now? Have you seen a shift post-election or like even leading up to the election? Have you seen like a a change in the way that comedy is working now? I think that there's like, for example, Colbert took off yeah. once this happened. And that was so happy because mm-hmm. I love him. And he just, seen, you know, so there are a lot of comics I know who I don't know if they even date political stuff before. Mm-hmm. Like Rory Scovel did some stuff last night. Right. And so it's like I think every, it's affecting everybody. It's almost like you can't not talk about right. it. Right. You know, but uh, I think we'd all like it to be over, so we don't have yeah. you know we we don't need the material. No, it was we had the same thing with Rob Ford when he was. I remember was I was here. I was here yeah. uh, a couple times when he was. And here. I, I would I would have like all these relatives, you know, when I go back for like Thanksgiving or Christmas or something like that, and you know, back to my little small town, and they, like nudge up to me and go, there's my uncle. He goes, you, you must be loving all these Rob Ford jokes. I go, I'd love the opportunity to write about other things. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Like, but you're right. Like, you can't not talk about because it, it, it consumed us as a city, right? And then, but now I, I've always said it is like Donald Trump is like Rob Ford, but directed by Michael Bay. Yeah, like it's, I see it's that. Just yeah, and, and you're it's asinine to be able to think it's like you know the brick wall behind you is on fire and you're standing in front of it going. So I had a Twinkie the other day. Yeah, it seems it seems everything seems uh, everything surreal. Yeah, and it's just like I don't know how we're gonna pull out of it. Because everything uh, it looks becomes rough. a thing, right? Uh, well, it looks rough. I mean, I'd like I'd like them to redo the election somehow. Yeah, but I don't think we have that rule in the no, U.S. No, uh, there's there's so many people scouring the Constitution right now. Special. Yeah. That's what I like about the parliamentary system mm-hmm. is they can call elections when they think right. Know, 
That's what I think we should. How are we in the polls? Call it today. Yeah, right. Yeah, get the stations out. Like Theresa May messed up because she called for oh, the yeah, vote yeah, yeah. too early or yeah. something. And we, it, it's it's weird. Like you know, Canada normally has like an election every year and a half, and we've somehow sort of calmed down a little bit because I think I think we've sort of seen like this is what happens when you have too many elections. Yeah, it's stupid just, uh... people show up and ruin the party. <laughs> um, but do like like that the the alternative show that you that you do and run. That you that you you do for the festival and stuff like that. Like, what's what's the type of thing that that you're always looking for? Like when you when you're curating the show, and you just go something odd. Yeah, I'm always looking for something. I feel like you know, one year it was a Domian because mm-hmm. he does impressions. Um, uh, anything. I love sketch people. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had Drew Michaels on one year, right. and so I love anything. That I think anything that veers towards Andy Kaufman or mm-hmm. that kind of comedy is, right. is is my favorite thing in a way because mm-hmm. it's very hit and miss. Right. You know? And I like that part to it. Right. Because your your own comedy itself is gloriously, uh, yeah, I'm going to do this. Right, right. And that's what I adore of it. Um, all day I was walking around giggling to myself saying, not on my watch. Not on my watch. Yep. Uh, I am DB or was it uh, HDMI right, <laughs> ladies? I was just now uh, uh, Nick at the festival gave me that line, mm-hmm. and for my, and I forgot that he gave it to me, so I started to ask everybody who's who gave me that line. I thought it was Anthony Jessel, now. right? But HDMI right, ladies, mm-hmm. I is taken off, yes. and I have to get key rings mm-hmm. or something assigned. T-shirts, I would say Jiffy Pop canisters. Yeah, yeah, I miss Jiffy Pop. Yes. <laughs> Don't we all? Not Don't really. We. But my wife makes uh, popcorn in a pan mm-hmm. with butter, mm-hmm. and it's fantastic. It's great and yeah. horrible for you. I thought it wasn't bad because it's got fiber. Yeah, there's that, but it's all the shit that you need to cook it in. Oh, yeah. I think well, that's the problem. Uh, and absolutely putting butter on top probably isn't uh-huh. good. But yeah, the Have you seen the new like small at-home uh, theater style? Popcorn makers? I think I have seen those, yeah. yeah. A friend of ours has one. And as soon as they say, oh, do you want some popcorn? And they scooped it out. And it was like, I was at a movie theater. I was like, oh, this is a game changer. Yeah, of course it really, yeah. And then you look at the ingredients you need to fire it up. It's like, oh, that much coconut oil, huh? Okay. Yeah. I can feel my arteries hardening as we speak. Right, right. But uh, uh, my my wife has argued, and I think she's right, that microwave popcorn's not great. Mm Mm-hmm. I got used to it. Yeah. I like the convenience yes. of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, we may, we get our own, uh, not beans, what are they? Kernels. Seeds. Kernels. <laughs> Kernels. It's a seed, of a germ of an idea. Right. Yeah, right. A and kernel we enjoy, of a corn. And so we do that. We watch, our, right. we watch our little movies. Mm-hmm. We have a lovely couple. Right. Uh, you sound very homebodied and nice. That's you know? me. And then, I'm comfy. Yeah. I'm cuddly. Mm-hmm. I'm friendly. Uh-huh. Unless you get on my wrong side and then I start screaming like a exactly. maniac. So what is it, what do you, in, in all of this, what is it, what is, where are you taking optimism in comedy? Where are you seeing like, you know, this is what I like the direction that it's going in? Well, the reason why I like the direction that's going is that, you know, when I started out, if you were gay, mm-hmm. you were very hesitant to say you were gay. Right. And so you have like, you know, I had a show last night. Hari Kanda Bolu. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's like you have all these names you never would have had. Mm-hmm. Uh, f- you know, three women on the show right. or whatever. So I think a lot of those walls are now broken down. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the old days, a comic, say if she was a female comic, we have to go on stage and go, I know what you're thinking, a lady doing comedy. Right, right, right. So it's, it's, it really has changed for the better, mm-hmm. I think. But who knows? There's always periods that they get like when sketch got really big in the 90s there mm-hmm. came to be a point where I think people were sick of it right. so it's like and then when stand up is too straight I kind of want a character too mm-hmm. you know not but for that, me but that's what spawned that's what spawned for you I'm guessing like the alternative show is like where you're like I don't want to see another white guy in a sports jacket with the sleeves rolled up Yes. I need to see something else. That's why I started the show. Right. And not only that, the, the, the festival back then really did gravitate more towards crowd pleasers. Mm-hmm. Now, if you go to the festival uh, in Montreal here, you see what I would consider almost all alternative comics. Right. I mean, Colin Quinn. I mean, some of these mm-hmm. people, it almost is like sometimes alternative means funny. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, but again, it goes, it goes back to that audience of like, what are they willing to accept? And it's that as a performer, you like, you look at the crowd and go, I see a lot of ball caps here. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I, do you have a lot of ball cap humor? 
No. What is a ball cap? Well, uh, oh, just, oh, I uh, totally took it the wrong. I thought you meant a bald cap. You mean baseball hats? <laughs> yeah, yeah, baseball hats. Yeah. Baseball hats yeah. connote. So, like, if you're in a, like a small town, 300 people, and then you know you look up and there's just like a sea of ball caps and camo vests, you go. Yeah. Okay. I know what material I'm it not could be doing trouble. tonight. Although sometimes I've missed read the crowd, but not if they have mm-hmm. caps on. Right. The uh, when when these shows are rolling in and uh, in when you've established yourself at JFL as like sort of like this, I would almost say like the authoritarian in this, where like the shots are going to be called and 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 that. Have you ever received like any flack after your state of the state of the industry? I have. Like yeah. the year I went for Louis C.K., mm-hmm. I kind of got people upset about that. Yeah, uh, from other comics sometimes. Okay, uh, but. A lot of my things were, I say, pre me being on uh, Prozac and in therapy okay. and post that. Okay. So na- now I'm just as a person generally letting things go mm-hmm. and realizing that this is, you know, I, it's not that I don't edit myself, but right. I'm trying to make the, the, the speech should be more of a roast in a way, mm-hmm. in, anyway. And uh, I'm trying to not get like too upset or worried about what the reactions are going to be and uh mm-hmm. you know and who but i mean i don't like confrontation so if i make fun of someone right. i don't want to meet them right. <laughs> that's why twitter is great yes twitter yes. i can hide you know where's uh, you know where's Ricky gervais across the ocean fire up the thumbs <laughs> let it go um last question i'll ask you because sure. uh, we gotta uh, we gotta get you out of here um what makes you what what is it uh that you're seeing in comedy right uh, what is it you're seeing in comedy right now that you think people got to go see this well, they, they got to see this person this act this venue what what's the one thing if you had to go you know, i i was always been a i've always been a big uh well ron but some people i think people haven't heard of but they have like right. ron funches everyone right. knows him now mm-hmm. he's so incredible i think rory scoville is incredible mm-hmm. uh incredible yeah. did i say incredible yeah, yeah. he and he and i did uh grand prairie alberta together we were trapped in a car five and a half hours each way <laughs> yeah so we've, yeah. got, we've gotten to know each other quite a bit. He's so yeah. funny to me. He is. And, uh, but I'm a huge James Adomian fan. Mm-hmm. I yeah, just love absolutely. what he does, and uh, I can't get enough. Yeah. He's great. Uh, Natasha Leggero, uh-huh. Maria Bamford. But mm-hmm. now Maria Bamford's all, that's not a new person coming no, out. No, no. Uh, but there are new people. The new people I see mm-hmm. are are excellent. Right. And where are you finding these new people? Are you like? Are you just like trolling YouTube, looking for nuggets like that way? Or are you going into into rooms and going, "This is like this is who I want on the next alternative show." I used to go out and even see more comedy to book the show, but okay. now I really don't anymore. But I kind of find out about everybody mm-hmm. usually. Mm-hmm. Or if I'm uh, like booking the thing, I'll look on at links right uh, a lot online. Can I guess? That Ian Abramson sent you a VHS tape in a fruit basket. <laughs> Can I guess that? Uh, no, we didn't. But we had the same. We had the same manager at one okay. point. Okay, all right, <laughs> that's fun. Uh, Andy, thank you so much. Thank you. This was thank fun. You. Great seeing you. Uh, next time you're in town, come by the house. We'll have a meal. Love to we'll, do we'll, it. Uh, we'll uh, have you back on again. Perfect. All the best, brother. Thank you, man. Thank you. We're shaking hands. You can't shaking see hands. Jimmy, you are always the podcast. Lately, lately. I find I rush